the community, we always joke, like, what other industry do you <laughs> you pony up cash for product that's going to kind of come down the line and you're not going to even physically see that I've product? I've got an answer for that. Oh, yeah? What is it? Bring me the next shiny new thing. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Big Fat Big Cast. My name is Brett, also known as Geek Over Forty, and today we got a special episode that's going to take you back in time. My co-host today is Phil, also known as Phil Fat Cat Bricks. What up, Phil? Hey. <laughs> Phil just hit puberty. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the hey it just really threw me off i'm doing the i'm doing the miles i'm doing the miles right <laughs> but um we have a very special guest today one that i don't think anyone has really heard his voice before i don't know he's been around since the beginning of the customs scene some would say he's the godfather of marvel you would know him as ed or a good fellow minifigs ed go ahead and say hi hey guys first of all brett let me uh it's an honor congrats on all the stuff that you've been doing, the the Geek Exchange, the Big Bad Fit Cast, honored to be here. Phil, we go way back. I know we're going to get into all this, but it's it's great. Th- thanks for having me. Yeah, well, you know, I've known you for a couple of years now. You were one of the first folks. You were like, you know, top tier dude in, in the world when I was getting involved in all this stuff. So the fact that now I just chat with you, you know, daily and now we're just chatting here. The fact before we started recording, we've been talking for about an hour and 15 minutes before I hit record. We had to keep cutting ourselves off to save for the podcast. Ed, so you you haven't been online much lately. You've been traveling a lot for work. I, we were talking about how you probably have a giant cache of, of figs waiting to be opened. Did you open up anything really good recently? Yeah, just a, a huge stash of stuff from MRM, uh, Gin, uh, LB, TMB, just stuff that I'm just kind of getting through. But to your point, it's it's i've been really busy but i'll always you know i'll always come back to to collecting this is kind of the one thing that i've held on to over time and we can get into kind of how i got into all this but i'm definitely still um a fan a marvel fan lego fan collector at heart when did you actually get involved in customs and how did you wind up doing it so you know every story has a beginning you know my hobby pro- traces back to you know when i was a kid i am at heart a superhero comic book fan, right? Specifically Marvel. You know, I grew up reading comics, going to the store. I remember going to the comic store when the releases, that that was when the drops were actually physical drops of comics. You know, X-Men, Avengers, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, you know, just took you into a world with like limitless possibilities, a sense of adventure. You know, I really wasn't an extrovert. And and a lot of these stories really spoke to me, uh, you know, Peter Parker or or X Men. Um, so seeing this kind of come, like the whole Marvel MCU was just like such a gift to me because I could share that with my kids. Um, connecting this to Lego, you know, my kids started, you know, when I had kids, they started getting into Lego as kids, and I kind of rediscovered Lego. And as you guys know, going back in 2012, that was when the first marvel lego the avenging cycle captain america came out and i was like what's this this is captain america i was like you kidding me this is awesome and then you know off we went and then phil this will go this will lead into the whole flicker days in terms of like expanding the opportunity of what what could be possible in in this world damn that was deep (laughs) no i I really i really uh I really uh, empathize with that because I too am a Marvel um, person at heart. You know, I do respect DC. I, I like the DC animated movies better than anything Marvel's produced. But generally, I am Marvel through and through, and it was because of that relatability. The whereas uh, DC might be all gods and monsters, you know, Marvel was the 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 comic brand to take ordinary people and put them in extraordinary circumstances and have the same normal lifelong struggles, you know, being the nerd or 
being broke. I mean, I could identify with those as, as a kid. So yeah, it is a blessing. Now, now that my childhood is now mainstream pop culture uh, to the point where some people are sick of it is just kind of a blessing. I know I don't understand why every time I hear people that they come across with like, oh, this is crap. I'm like, dude, I'm just amazed that we're getting this at all. I'll, I'll sit back and... And you, still, and you still feel that way after Secret Invasion? <laughs> Could have been better, <laughs> but you know what? The you know spoilers. We got to see some semblance of a super scroll, so that was cool. Um, you know, you know, not to get too sidetracked. I think you know the MCU is a perfect example where you have a success. It's a very story driven, character driven. Like the first Iron, go back and rewatch the first Iron Man. Go rewatch, you know, Captain America, Winter Soldier, or First Avenger. Like. These were amazing standalone stories that were really thoughtful, well crafted, and then they just got away from themselves. I think people just saw it as a huge money churning machine, and just too many cooks in the kitchen. I think that that's a shame. Hopefully, they'll get back to the roots. We have a, a chance for a reboot for Fantastic Four and X Men. They better not screw that up. Oh, so everyone knows me as the Spidey guy, but I'll tell you right now, um, I will collect every Fantastic Four custom that comes out. I've got a few by Engineerio. I've got like one by Muddy River and I've got a bunch by Pop Punk Monkey and Big Kid Bricks, but I am a big Fantastic Four fan. That was like my go-to comic besides Spider-Man growing up. Like anytime the Hulk and the Thing were to fight, I was there. I had to buy it. So I'm really looking forward to that. This right, this leads into, Phil, I was checking the first time I, you know, communicated with you via Flickr was almost 10 years ago to ask you about the MH80 figs, you know, the... Oh, that's how it started. Human they, they're just using me for my connections, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we, but we, we've been... Tra- we've been over, this is the first time we're actually speaking, so i got to thank Brett for that. But we, we've been chatting yeah. for 10 years, you yeah, know, we, through we, Flickr. We were, no. we, were, we were actually buddies on Flickr, you know. I mean, it wasn't a close-knit community, but but we had some people that we were closer to than others. And me and you, I would say you were my closest Flickr friend, you and Andrew, you know, Minifigures UK. Um, but yeah, yeah, man, it's, it's crazy that it's taken us this long to actually talk. <laughs> so, Phil, 10 years. So how did you get involved in all this? Because we may, have, we may have covered this in a previous episode, but we might as well start. And reiterate it again. No, no, I don't think we have actually. Um, I mean, I mean, bottom line for me is I am an absolute superhero slut. I uh, <laughs> I eat, sleep, and breathe anything superheroes. Uh, and unlike you guys, it is completely Marvel and DC, and now pretty much anything else. Image Comics, you know, Valiant. You could I could go all day. So. Um, Lego, again, that's always been something that's been important to me. Uh, I loved it as a kid. I can still remember to this day now, I'd spent all week building um, uh, the Lego space team. It's called the Mighty Mogul in the U- UK. It was a big robot, it was. But it was called something else in America, like Captain something, something like that. Uh, but I spent all week uh, building that. And came home from school on a, on a Monday, and we used to carpool with another family and their kid came in with me and he intentionally knocked it over and even now when I think about it I think I hope he's dead <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's that's what Lego means to me um, obviously you get to that point where you hit your sort of um, your teens uh, where you, you didn't admit you like Lego when you're in high school uh, you'll get stuffed into a lot of lockers in America and in the UK you'll just get beaten up or thrown in the river so uh, <laughs> you, um, you, uh, you, you sort of push it down ignore it for a bit and I think that I went for a while then, obviously, you you know, you move on to other things, you start going out, uh, drinking on a weekend, that sort of thing. You haven't got money for this sort of stuff. But I can still remember to this day, I was in the local supermarket uh, with uh, my partner at the time. And I remember turning my head and seeing uh, these brightly colored bags, the CMFs, uh, and thinking, oh my, they, well, those look cool. I think I made a comment like that, you know, um, the look of disdain on my on my partner's face, it was just, just heartbreaking, you know? Um, so obviously that was, uh, there was no chance of any Lego, uh, during that relationship. No chance of any relationship. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that was the point. Uh, eventually that came to an end. Uh, one of the first things I did probably was a coping mechanism at the time, but was go and pick up a bunch of CMFs. <laughs> um, obviously when I started with those, then I realized superhero, uh, Lego was a thing. So I started buying up figures. Um, I got to the point where I didn't have anything left to get. Uh, so I made the silly mistake of... Uh, discovering that there were um, Comic Con exclusive figures out there. Uh, so my collector mentality is like Pokemon, got to catch them all, you know? So I 
spend a lot of time researching them and eventually I decided, right, it's time to start looking on eBay now. And I managed to find someone in the UK, which is was like a miracle back then, selling um, a full set of the 2012 figs. So they were um, four figs, two DC, two Marvel. Um, it was the Symbiote Spidey. So that's the most expensive Lego head you'll ever buy because it's just the Venom body. Um, there was Jean Grey, Phoenix, um, Shazam, and uh, Bizarro. So I got that set, and obviously it was expensive at the time. I think it was £460 I paid for four of them. So fucking bargain now in comparison. They're probably worth, they're probably worth triple that each now. Um, and the, the guy who sold them to me as well, he actually threw in this uh, exclusive, well, not exclusive, but um, it was a Bilbo Baggins figure. So at the Comic Con 2012, you could put together a Bilbo Baggins figure by visiting several booths. And they gave it, they gave them this big map. And every map, you've got a sticker for each booth you visited and a part. And at the end, then, you were awarded with this little cloth bag with a Hobbit logo, because it was all to promote the Hobbit. Um, and that's what made it exclusive. It's a regular Bilbo Baggins fig, but in that pouch, uh, it's exclusive. So this guy threw this in, saying, I've got no use for it now. So... I didn't think much of it. It wasn't a superhero fig. I had no interest. So uh, I've recently looked at that on eBay. That's worth about $3,000 now. Jeez. <laughs> I bet that guy is kicking himself. That's crazy. <laughs> so, that actually brings up a great point around SDCC figs because that'll lead into kind of the very first customs. But before I do that, before I forget, I do want to give a shout out to my kids, Henry, Chloe, my spouse, Jay, he, they're going to be listening to this. And why I got into this, you know, the whole... Mar reimagining of Marvel through Lego. And then the SDCC figs, as you said, like I never threw down for any of those, but a lot of the custom, you know, when we were hunting for potential, you know, alternatives, like some people would put together mocks. And this is where the, the initial community on Flickr, like you and I met there, you know, um, Andrew was there, Adam was there. Um, and then some of these early brands, if you want to, if we want to start talking about like Pop and K Monkey, Penzora, and then the very first, my very first customs was actually a Muddy River Doctor Strange. And I'm so glad that, you know, Bo, you know, shout out to MRM is still, is still printing out there. And I just, just got his Professor X, but that was my very first, what was your very first, um, true blue pr pad print custom, Phil? Well, that was the thing. I mean, I, I you know, I bought, I, I spent all this money on these SDCC figs, and of course, that feeling doesn't last very long. I mean, the look at the look at the theme song to this podcast, and it bring me the next shiny new thing. So, <laughs> um, I st I started going online, um, and I don't know how I came across it, but I think I came across some deckled stuff because that was very prevalent in the early days of the scene. Um, Wait, and just sorry to I interrupt. You mean decaled for for the Western uh, folks? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We, we, we... <laughs> it's funny. An episode that I've yet to release that I'm editing right now, I interviewed Mini Bigs, and uh, Carrie was introducing us to the word deckle. Well, in all fairness, your English is based off our English, eh. so, you know, we're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's an international podcast. I'm, 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 I'm re we're recording from Singapore, so what can you say? It's global. <laughs> But no, but um, yeah, so so obviously a lot of um, decaled figs then, okay. Uh, <laughs> um so yeah, I think uh, I ended up coming across some posts and, and back then the main two brands were Online Sailing and um, uh, Crystal. And my first ever fig, after about, I think it was about two months of stalking people, just looking at all these accounts on Flickr, I plucked up the courage to ask some questions. Um, uh, and it was Andrew, minifigures.co.uk. So he was literally my first point of contact into this scene. And he was very kind and he was very patient because I, I probably had a million questions as most people do when they when they start this, you know, they they fall into this scene um so i sort of got the the skinny on everything that was going on with the scene and i thought right let's uh let's try my first ever international purchase so that was um the harvey dent online sailing figure and i'm not sure if many people know but back in the early days online sailing pad printed uh so this was basically uh the design you see on the two-faced figure from the actual um lego dc range but it's just harvey dent so it's before his accident uh, so, so yeah, I, I received it. It took about two weeks to come in as it, as it normally does with international stuff. Uh, it was beautiful. I loved it. And I think literally about two weeks went by and then I literally picked up three crystal figs and it literally hasn't stopped since then. It's been over, well, yeah. Well, it hasn't stopped because now. you're still waiting for them. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm still waiting for those. Yeah, yeah. Chris does, hey, hey, Brett, Chris does probably a, a full podcast, separate podcast. He's but, my white you know, whale. Um, you have to. Get, I, I want to. I'm going to try and get him by the <laughs> end of 2024. I, I really am. Um, or 3024. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Season um, been planned. But yeah, I, let's give credit where where credit is due. I mean, Christo was and main, still maintains super high quality. To say what you want about his release schedule, just beautiful designs. And when I first received my set of Crestos and, and threw down for them, I really understood what, what the hype was about. It's the pack start even before you look at the fig, the packaging, just everything, you know, there's some of the, they'll just go down as well, some of the best. And just what he did in terms of custom pieces as well um, is, you know, broke the mold. I also want to give a shout out to, to Adam as well, just real quick in terms of that's one of my early Probably maybe my second fig was the Arachnic Hero um, from PCB, and it's still one of my all-time faves. Faves the whole the whole silver web design. It's one of the rare cases where custom is just much better than the official variant. But go ahead. Well, don't, don't, we're going to get into all this anyway. Don't worry. It's all part of the uh, the, the script we have going. Quick side <laughs> note though about Christo. Yeah, anytime there's a naysayer, it's like, oh, it's not worth the money. I wouldn't pay that much. I can get it off AliExpress. I'm like. Once I finally got my first Christo Spidey in hand, I was like, wow, this is otherworldly. This is holy shit. This just feels different in my hand. It, and this museum level quality. Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. Even compared to other premium brands, it's like look at the difference between DVD and Blu ray almost sometimes. The, the print is just so crisp. It is the easiest, most joyous, carefree, tro- least troublesome figures to shoot are Christo figs. For my photography stuff, there's never there's never a mismark, there's never a, a, a besmirch on the print or a fingerprint that gets picked up, or or a piece that looks feels like the ink is raised. I mean, it's just the dust doesn't even seem to fall on it. It's insane. It dust doesn't seem to fall on because you probably after that package up really carefully, <laughs> yeah. make sure that you put Look, it away. Man, I, really I'm the nicely worst. Up. Like I'll, I'll I'll eat some pizza then pick up a minifig. You got folks here on their IG stories wearing gloves and shit. And I feel like all like, I feel like an idiot. I'm like, well, I just, you know, I handle it. Yeah. I probably handle mine with a little bit too much care, but the other litmus test, I mean, I think Phil, you and I joked about this once is the, the litmus test is if there was like a fire happening, you could only save one group of figs. Like for me, Christo immediately comes to mind, right? I'm just going to. Yeah. Gonna because I can sell those. them to pay back with what I've lost. <laughs> yeah, buy your new house, yeah. I, I was on the Rex secondhand market today. Actually, I was looking for something else just, to, just for price comparisons. And he still has a fantastic four Christo. He's got it up there for $1,300. I was like, I uh, don't think that's going to go <laughs> anywhere, but the highest I've seen it sold for is six fifty. I think. I think for a little while he had a private um, page for a couple of listings like that. And one of them was the, um, uh, the Jay Garrick flash and the rival, which is like the reverse flash for the classic flash, you know? Um, and they were going for something like 4,500. Uh, I, I got in there a couple of months ago and it actually sold after a couple of years. I was amazed. <laughs> but you, you know, what's so funny, Phil is, um, you know, again, like I'm so thankful of having, you know, this community, you guys in, in my chat group and, and just everybody's so been so great, the brands, the resellers, the community, everything. But the biggest hate I ever got was when Christo sent me that silver Mark one set, you know, in the box and like, you know, uh, and people were like, just like, why you get like, oh my gosh, people just took me out into the shed for that. I didn't ask for it. He just, he did end up sending that to me. And I have to admit, I, that's that's one of the, the crown jewels of my collection, I would say. Yeah, rightfully so at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, you also deserved it. You know, you did a lot of promotion. Um, and, you know, if it's a gift, it's a gift. There's no reason to actually hate on you. So it's silly. It's just jealousy, isn't it, at the end of the day? You know, we all we all suffer it. I'm, I'm, I was jealous of it at the time, too. But uh, you, uh, <laughs> you rightfully rightfully got it, you know? And besides, the grey one was awesome anyway, wasn't it? The standard grey. I'm, gl- I mean, and I'm glad Brett takes some of that heat off of me now. <laughs> <laughs> do I do get hateful DM sometimes? People saying, you know, why do you have that, or why do you have access to that? I'm like, because I've been friends with the guy. Like, um, uh, shout out to one fine day. He commissioned uh, Leco Leco. Super nice guy. Yeah. Quite a few times to make these special Spidey figs. They were like limited to like eleven made and he reached out saying do you want one which of course the answer is yes because i want to support him and i want to buy spideys and also like a is an amazing brand that's treated me very well and i like supporting them whenever possible 
But can I give a shout out a little bit to you, Brett? Because you, nothing came easy for you. You did your homework. You hustled. You made connections. You reached out to me, the community. You really understood what what the dynamics were all about. I mean that you deserved where you are today. You really have put in the work. I appreciate I mean, that. It's it's hurt. not it's not yeah it's not been easy, and I still struggle in some areas. This could be a whole other podcast in itself. But we, as we were talking pre recording. Uh, I was actually asking Ed for advice because when you get to a level where you're friends with everybody, how do you avoid pissing off somebody? Because, you know, there are, these are in the end, these resellers are businesses that are trying to make, you know, make money and brands are trying to sell figs. And how do you, you, how do you deal with the feeling of not wanting to disappoint somebody or let somebody down or give an impression of favoritism or whatever? Because you know, in the end, we all want to get our figs we want, right? So you don't want to risk anything that, that puts that in jeopardy. But you also don't want to disappoint anybody. hundred percent. I mean, I think, you know, to, to this point, Brett, and it's funny, like you, we, if we had a behind the scenes podcast, that would have been a very interesting one. But I, I, to your point, I don't want to let anybody down. I actually view myself as a community and as a voice for customs in a lot of ways. Um, I want to give brands a platform as well. You know, I'm, 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 I, I consider myself lucky to be friends with all the major resellers, all the major brands that do, you know, Marvel figs. Um, and I'll, we'll give a shout out to a lot of them on this podcast, I'm sure. Um, and I just want to give, you know, and that's almost for a self-serving purpose, because for my priority, similar to Phil's, is I want to assemble the most complete Marvel universe that I can while I'm in it. And the more brands that are out there and the more that people kind of get to know and give them a voice and give them an opportunity to succeed is great for me so that I can, you know, expand my collection. Um, I was going to say, we're going to cover a lot of this. Don't worry, Ed. It is all sort of, um, you know, queued up. Um, one thing I'll skip to just now, though, because you've mentioned Marvel. Uh, why why Marvel and not DC? Is there anything specific about DC that you just weren't drawn to? Or let me just get this one out of the way now while we have it. I... First of all, as a comic book fan and as a fan of like actual artists, like the Dark Knight series that Frank Miller did will go down as an all-time great. I have that on my shelf. You know, I have Frank Miller as a, as an artist is amazing. Um and actually if you take a look at the 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 Nolan series like again, they'll go down as a goat of all time in terms of superhero films. So I appreciate those stories. I appreciate, you know, the um the lore of of batman um superman and uh, not so much i always kind of viewed superman as a guy who did the take on that which was he was like you know he's all powerful nothing in harm and they had to create kryptonite i think was it like uh, kill bill um talked about how how weak that that character was actually as so i'm not i wouldn't say i'm a huge superman fan i'm more of a batman fan in terms of dc but i actually just grew up reading you know, t similar to Brett, I mean, I wasn't, you know, the homecoming, like, starting quarterback of, of the high school. I was just kind of quiet kid. Um, I grew it into myself, like, in terms of, like, I was a late bloomer, I would say. But I was a, an avid comic book fan. I did collect those those comics. And, and Marvel just spoke to me in a lot of ways. The Peter Parker, the X-Men that were a little bit different. Um and so, yeah, it just drew me to those stories more, I would say. They they do say that Marvel tends to have more relatable characters. I will admit that one of the biggest criticisms aimed at DC tends to be that it's just a bunch of gods and monsters, a term that they've actually used. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm a big fan of, and yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's like X-Men have never been like a cornerstone to me. It's like something amazing. I respect the X-Men universe, but I couldn't relate. The X-Men are parables to, you know, minorities right and i am being that being that look i'm a cis white dude right so i didn't feel that systemic <laughs> institutional racism hey, you said it not no, me. i'm not i'm like i'm I'm white bread dude I'm, I'm brown hair brown eyed i'm boring as fuck i didn't feel i didn't deal with a lot of that institutionalized and systemic racism and oppression that exists in in the in the western world and or worldwide the struggle for something greater wasn't something i could easily identify with the individual struggle to be something better than what I was is something I can identify with. And that's where I felt I found a relationship in with like the Fantastic Four and uh, Spider-Man specifically and some of the other younger heroes of that time. 
And so the idea of, you know, being a victim of circumstance and and then you got the X-Men that are just like, oh, I was born with it. I was born with this healing factor. It's all good. You know, so I understand the struggles that go with it. I really actually, I did enjoy the Chris Claremont era. Amazing. And, yeah. and going back to DC, yeah, all gods are like Superman that are just, you know, they're just, you know, I got this ring. I got willpower. I can make anything. That doesn't really appeal to me as much. But I'll say this. My two of my favorite all time favorite storylines are Kingdom Come and yep. the Injustice comic series. So both what if for DC. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. It really. Well, you know what I liked about it? I mean, I knew I mean, I, I know D- DC lore, but I also um, what I liked about Injustice was that it as you go through year one, two, three, four and five and then Injustice two, it uh, it spans like the entire DC mythos. You know, they go into the gods, they mm-hmm. go into the magic, you know, they go into and I thought that was really cool how they found a way to keep keep the, the you know just when you think they've maxed it out they find a new way of doing it but it was a it was a good um, balance of principles between Batman and, and it's it's plausible as well isn't it it's plausible storyline absolute power corrupts absolutely you know what it predates Homelander yeah yeah in fairness DC DC themselves have predated it man you had things like uh, Superman Red Sun before yeah. that you know so that's basically a what if story is if if he landed in Russia instead of in Kansas or whatever you know in Spolville. yeah that was a great one too uh, but, I love I love the Elseworlds series for DC I really do yeah yeah Killing Joke was a good novel I hated the animated version yeah there's a lot of good stuff in DC but for Marvel to me it's who could I identify with and as a kid it was Marvel so that's what I stuck with you know, Brett, I, I, I just a, just a real quick point to just to close out on that. I think subconsciously that was one of the reasons why I did connect with the X Men, and still today is one of my favorites. It, is that you know, growing up as an Asian American, I did really relate to that. And then, and then when Shang Chi came out, you know, with I could share that with my kids as well, having seeing an Asian American superhero or sorry, an Asian superhero in the in the you know, broader Marvel universe was great to see that come come to life. So I definitely connected to that. Especially after they shortchanged you with Iron Fist as well. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, shows. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll admit that one. That show, that's one Marvel show I never finished because it just annoyed me. It was just, how many episodes do you need to convince somebody who you are? It was like, what, four episodes? And it's like, oh, look, I like M&Ms. You know, just... <laughs> <laughs> Getting out of comics, getting out of cinema, going back to Flickr. <laughs> sorry, sorry to the audience. You just got a bunch of old people here reminiscing that, you know, getting Let's do it. to connect over this stuff. <laughs> it's we're going to we're going to deviate. Speaking of classic comic, just want to say uh, Ling announced his Living Tribunal fig this week. I'm very excited for it. So good. He's such a good guy. Yeah, too. it's another LED size uh, fig. Yeah. Give a shout, shout out to Ling. Again, he's in Singapore. I've met him a couple of times. Very good guy. Super nice guy. And I love what he's doing as well, right? Doing, sticking to his knitting on, on things. Uh, I love, I, I'm a, I have a soft spot for the comic related stuff like Mr. J, you know, Ling stuff and some of the stuff that Jin does as well on the comic side. You know, I think at heart, I will always gravitate towards that. I'm a sucker for that stuff. Same. Absolutely. Actually, I've scaled back my collecting because, well, was more first of all, Spider Verse is burying me. <laughs> I've actually scaled back to not pursuing comic book stuff anymore, except for Ling. Ling's the only one who I'll buy from uh, and support because he's just been such a great innovator in the space and doing things that nobody else is doing. I think of Ling and Mr. J as like two sides of the same coin because Mr. J does a lot of DC and obviously Ling is Marvel. So for me, they're, they're both just spot on you know and as you guys know my favorite thing is the core of the characters I, I prefer those to the, any of the movies or anything and my biggest love always has been game accurate figs because to me uh i started off loving official figs and they're like unofficially official figs really aren't they you know when, they, when you take it a design from the game it is officially just never got made so that's a great segue into uh, back on the Flickr days talking about some of the brands that were populated back then and the styles in which they printed yeah, yeah. so like muddy river he pretty much exclusively prints that style the video marvel superheroes video games yeah, well, we, we started off with Crystal Online Sailing. Uh, Eclipse Graphics did a little bit as well. Uh, a couple of pad printed figs back in the day. Um, we had Pop Punk Monkey, and then Mini Figs for You came in a little bit shortly after that. And we had a few other smaller brands then, like um, Custom Bricks, Penzora. I don't know if anyone remembers yep. those, but they had print like sandpaper. <laughs> um, <we had> <laughs> I've got their big time Spideys. I went and picked them up. They still have, yeah. they still have all their figs available <laughs> on the website, they're still around. 
Was that actually was that actually Penzola or was that um, Minifigs.pl the big time Spidey? Uh, Minifigs PL did one big time Spidey. Penzora did yeah, did like yeah. the six different colors, like a blue, a white, a red, ah. a green. They just started hammering them out like an orange. They did a bunch of those. Yeah, I must have dropped off Penzora at that point because uh, they were they were never my favorite. They were always low quality, even in the early days. You know, they felt a bit uh, a bit cheap. We had a similar brand in the UK called Small Green Pea, and they did do one fig, which is still oh uh, yes, they, I remember that. Yeah, they, they did a killer moth fig with a custom cow, uh, mold as well, and that is stunning. Okay. it really is. Even to this day, educate I love that me thing. because killer moth seems to be a really popular character lately. I don't know what the pop art is. I think there must have been something in the comics. I haven't been keeping well, up no, with No, I mean classic honest, Killer Moth, think... like video game Killer Moth, because uh, there's this one girl, Moxie Bricks or whatever, that she's working on one for a while. And I know somebody else had released oh, one. Oh, yeah, I've seen a few. Has been working yeah, on one for a while. And it just seems like a lot. I, I knew of the character, but I'm just like, damn, I just see like it's popping up everywhere lately. That one, that one that was um, available through Small Green Pea, it was only by request, and she only made like one every six months or so. So I, I think I waited about two and a half years to get my hands on one, and eventually she made one for me. And I know that over the years, it's probably been the thing that I've been uh, given offers on the most. Do you know what I mean? It's something that people really covet. So I think it's just, maybe it's some people that uh, either have been around as long as us, perhaps not as active, or maybe it's just, they've been chatting to those kinds of people. And is it, is it them, you know, and they think perhaps they uh, no, it's not bad. It's digital. Um, but, it, but like I said, it's got this custom molded head and it's hand molded too, but it is very well done, you know. Um, but yeah, it just, it just looks perfect. Honestly, it looks exactly, it looks like it's just popped off the screen from the game, basically. It's a brilliant thing. It really is. Um, so yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, that was the only real thing of note they did. I think they did try and tempt a Firefly fig from the game too, but that one just didn't come out right. But, uh, but yeah, so... Oh, see, those are the brands we had. And then uh, for about a year or so, perhaps, that was that was everything that we had. And then we got a couple of other brands uh, join the free. We had um, not another custom minifigure. Anybody remember those? NACM. Yes. NACM. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, one of my first. Uh, the Wasp France. was one they of my first. They did some Black Panthers, did they not? Yeah, they did a Black Panther. They only did about six, seven figs in the end. Um, there's a bit of a story behind that. We might get into that later, but uh, yeah. What's the story? It was... Um, <laughs> I mean, basically, they, they they were really popular. They were really successful as well. Um, and then the knockoff brands started appearing. Yep. And they started stealing their designs. And they took it really badly. They just, you could tell their responses to, to people's posts and comments were, were were sort of short and abrupt and curt and nasty even. Um, they eventually uh, just said, that's it. We're going to stop making figures. If people are going to rip us off, we're going to stop making it. You know, I, I think they would have had a market there. I think they could still be going even to this day if they uh, if they stuck it out. But uh, something happened behind the scenes there where they, they just absolutely gave up. And sadly enough, I ended up technically getting scammed by them because uh, I had a lady Sif figure that I ordered from them. They never sent it. After about six weeks, I chased it. They said, oh, very sorry. We'll get one sent out straight away. And that was the last I ever heard of them. Um, and uh, obviously, I think I've mentioned this before. That was one of my grail figs, Lady Sif. And I had a lot of uh, hit and misses with it over the years. It took me about six, seven years to get my hands on one of those. But uh, but yeah, they, they, they did really take it hard. And I think they... Um, you know, they just sort of completely left the community behind, you know, no love for it at all. It really, really did affect them. So, so obviously they were out, but we had other brands join the fray around the same time. We had, um, obviously we had Phoenix Custom Bricks. Uh, Adam was a fan prior to um, starting to do a bit of design work, you know, for, for other brands. And and then, of course, he made his own fix. Um, we had Kale Customs come in, so that's Kyle. Uh, and obviously we know him. He, he does a lot of mutants, but he also does... Yeah, he'll be, uh, he'll be on the podcast in the future. Well. We've already talked. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, By awesome. the way, I was his first customer. <laughs> Talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know I definitely wasn't Adam's first customer because I remember I'm always I'm always suspicious of new brands. Always. No matter how much time passes, I'm always a bit suspicious. So this guy comes out of nowhere and suddenly he's saying, Oh, I'm making this red robin fig and this. I'm like, who's this new dude? I don't trust this guy. I'm not buying from him. And then um I uh, I did have a crystal uh, red robin with a cow with a cowl and everything, you know. So um I didn't rush out to get it, but then when I saw the actual quality from people posting i was like oh damn i gotta get my hands on that gambit fig straight away uh so at that point then i i thought fuck it i can risk it you know <laughs> yeah it's awesome guy Lo love kyle got obviously have all his stuff been a huge supporter of his yeah. his recent yeah. releases as well so looking forward to this not to date this episode but this was actually the day after he just revealed his new Iceman version 2 and his yeah, omega yeah, red just, and the yeah. ice slide is brilliant and I wish I, I awesome. sent, so I did a mock ice slide um, a couple of years ago for a Spider-Man and his amazing friends post. 
and uh, it had his version one in the Firestar from the Daily Bugle. And uh, I had Engineerio's uh, 1960 Spidey in it. And I was like, dude, I spent ages trying to build an ice slide for that post. And now you've just got one right here. <laughs> so, You know, one really cool thing about KO Customs for the time as well, because uh, really for, for many years, the only person making custom parts was really Christo. Um, he was completely unique in, in, on the scene for that. But Kyle... He, his first fig was um, the original Nightcrawler's version one. And the custom parts that came on that were actually melted down Lego as well. Yeah, actually, so that, the, fir was... the very first one was that Udon yeah, Pass Master. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then the, the, then the uh, Nightcrawler, which is amazing. Yeah, uh, and and it was just it was just so special as well because it was it was you know technically official Lego. I'm sorry, Ed, you said the first one was from... what? The task master the udon version he, he didn't do oh, many no, runs no, of that that wasn't the first one mate that was one of his last ones on on the flicker days actually that was the udon taskmaster that was about three three to four designs in that was udon taskmaster what was his first and second then his night crawler was the first one um i think the second one was uh, i can't remember the name of the characters a cyborg uh he was in the agent's shield show as well so a deathlock yeah, Deathlock. Deathlock was uh, yeah, Deathlock the Cyberator, that's it. So that was his uh I think that was his second thing, but I'm I'm absolutely certain that the um uh, teleporter was the first thing though. Because I remember it being so special because of those custom parts, you know, and, and the fact that it was Lego. So that was really cool. Um and then of course we had a couple of other um community members become brands. You had Muddy River, uh Muddy River Minifigs back then in MRM prints now. He did take a big hiatus, but he's uh, obviously he's returned recently. And um, we had uh, Paris Custom Bricks as well. He started uh, releasing some figs and he did some really cool classic DC characters from a JLA sort of period, you know, and they were awesome as well. Um also, and I I I, I need to double check this, but I'm I'm ninety-nine percent certain I'm right. Um uh, I'm pretty sure Brick Tactical used to be called Brick Ultra. And they did release a couple of figs as well. They did an Iceman fig. Um, they did um, Roy Harper, uh, Red, you know, like um, not Red Arrow, Arsenal, you know. And um, I think they made a third fig, but I can't for the life of me remember what it was now. But yeah, but, uh, but it's amazing to think. There's a brand that's still out there now to this day, known for something completely different that once was uh, in the custom superhero scene as well, you know. Yeah, and the other one... Um... The, the, there's MH80 that we connected on very first, and you would have loved yeah, them because yeah. they were game game related. Uh, very short run of, the, of their stuff. And the other thing is, I think that to go back a little bit on the NACM is their Black Panther cowl again, which was not many people were doing those molds. He was probably again one of the very first one to do to those yeah, molds. That was well then, before Chris or Funny Brick did one, wasn't it? Actually, years before. Yeah, exactly. And then they took it, like you said, they took it really hard. When, when, you know, the bootlegs got, you know, a hold of their designs and then started mass producing them. And yeah, I remember chatting with them and they were really bent out of shape of that, but, but, but about that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't blame them at the end of the day, you know, you put a lot of work into something and it's not cheap to get these things printed and made up, you know? So I, I can, I can appreciate the frustration there. It's just a shame they went out on, on a bit of a sour note, you know, I'm not sure if it happened to many other people, what happened to me. Um, you know, but uh, but yeah, it, it is what it is. You know, you you forgive and you forget, don't you? You know, well, obviously I haven't forgotten, but I have forgiven. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Um, I'm not one to argue for the presence of bootlegs, but you know, that's how I got into all this. You guys were sharing your stories earlier. What you guys pulled off in Flickr is what got me involved in customs after it migrated to Instagram. My first set. So I had a dark period in Lego as well, where I liked it as a kid, but I was mostly into like He Man and you know Transformers and whatnot. And uh, my kids started buying Legos. And then there was this like Venom fig, which I thought was really cool that came out. And I started buying the sets with my kids, but then I started playing with them more. I I've always been a big um, memorabilia collector. Like if anyone's seen pictures of my office, I've got like my Captain America Endgame suit. You know, I've got, you know, my Star-Lord helmets and other movie mar paraphernalia all over the place uh, from Marvel. But Lego came out with a Hall of Armor set. And I thought it was amazing. Yep. And I was like, this is so cool. I thought, wow, I'm going to be super clever. And I'm going to like, uh, you know, I want to build all a thing for all 42 suits from Iron Man 3. <laughs> so so I get on, start Googling, you know, Iron Man Lego, because I don't even know. I didn't know anything about Bricklink or even, you know, any Lego database. And I was just trying to see where I could find the other suits that were supposedly made for the Hall of Armor. And uh, that's when I came across uh, Kenny. Uh, KF86's uh, Flickr account 
and he had made this he made the stark mansion from iron man 3 with on the cliff face and as you walk around the back end of it there was the underground elevator to the hall of armor and he had all these figs of every armor and i'm like this is amazing how did this happen you know where did these come from and then i it just let me down this rabbit hole and i started searching out all these these figs and then eventually somehow i came across soon saw chicken bricks another another great person in this community i yep, he had awesome all guy. these spideys and i was like this is this is crazy we're always like and then i i didn't realize they were bootleg and then eventually i discovered aliexpress and this is back when aliexpress would take the pit the whole picture of the figure not just like a head or or a torso before the lawyers were coming down so it was really easy to shop and then i discovered super buy aliexpress and i was owning all these asian markets and and wholesale shippers uh, and drop shippers uh, that i could use to procure all these bootleg sets from overseas you know the le pin and the king and all those other brands, SH, whatever. I eventually built my bootleg Hall of Armor. Then the Iron Man, once I got it complete, then the Iron Man book came out with all, all the armors <laughs> in it. And then that and then that became my Hall of Armor. And then I said, screw it. I finally dove into Top Mountain and started replacing them all. Just to drill down on that one, Brett, I think one of the reasons I actually started getting a lot of followers was I started posting a, my collection of the Hall of Armor. Just And you had to do a Franken- stein version of it like the official ones and some of the bootleg ones just to get i'm a completist as phil said you know i just i don't care where it's coming from and then just putting the posts of the hall of armor down and you know by the way phil while we were talking i did check so the taskmaster dark blue one came later but the very first custom that ko put out was a very limited is the sand blue digital print um taskmaster Yes, that came out. I yeah, completely that's... forgotten about that, actually. I'm going to have to go looking for that now, am I? <laughs> well, <laughs> Phil, your credibility is shot on this show. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. 20... No, I remember, uh, the only reason I remember that, because I was, I think, technically, you know, Kyle's first customer. I bought that when he first posted that. And I connected through Edwin on that, if you guys remember Edwin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like I just talked to him now, actually. He is, he is around. Super nice guy, yeah. But anyway. yeah, so yeah, completionist. So, and yeah, I ran across Soon Saul's page. And then eventually Ed, I did discover your page and Phil's page. And Phil had a bunch of Spideys. And then you had your Arachno Girl, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the episode. And that that uh, sold yeah. me because that was a very special character for me. But we'll we'll get to that later. But um I want to go back to what we were saying about Flickr. Phil, you you mentioned you want to talk about the great uh what'd you what'd you call it, the C and D debacle? Yeah, yeah. Well, just before we get into that, just to point out as well, you said about you saw my page on a bunch of Spideys. Believe it or not, in the Flickr days, I was known as the Spidey guy. And then this young upstart comes on to Instagram and, and just completely steals my thunder. <laughs> I'm not bitter at all, Brett, honestly. I was going to ask you, this is the battle, the battle of the Spidey. It was just, Phil was always the Spidey guy, but Brett, you know, came in, took your crown. I hope you're not too bent out of shape about that, Phil. <laughs> at, at this point, Brett is worth about five Phils in Spidey terms, Yeah, honestly. but now you're the zombie guy. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, yeah, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> but no, honestly, it, it is amazing how, how 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 you've gone back and tracked all these down. Honestly, it is it is bloody impressive. I think you put more work into that. I, put my I still remember the day I got the last Lyle Brick Spidey fig I was looking for. Good lord, that was that was a great day. Those were the hardest to get. Were all the Lyle Brick figs? I was worried for a while. I had to like um, put in my will. The MRM carnage that you were kept on looking for. I probably had to put that. Uh, if I ever, if anything ever happens to me, this is going to. Yeah, print. and Phil, Phil was I'm dangling in front one. of me, saying, "You don't got this one, do you, buddy?" <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, you know what? Someone, uh, and they just gave it to me, and I was forever grateful. That was that was really special. And then, and then out of nowhere, Muddy's like, "Oh, I've got a version two coming." <laughs> And then, oh, yeah. <laughs> and the funny thing is, Phil bought that from Andrew at co.uk. Uh, he bought it from him, and so that version two sat at Phil's house for a number of months <laughs> as a hostage. And I sent him pictures of Aku, yeah. <laughs> but uh, one last bit of um, history as well. Actually, um, you probably know of um, an account on IG called Brick Hero Graphics. Of yep. course. Well, back in the Flickr days, he was known as MNAP73, and he did actually release a couple of figs back in the day. Um, he did a game-accurate, digitally printed Green Arrow fig, and he did do a couple of Fantastic Four figs, funny enough, Brett. 
So that's uh, that's that's just a lovely bit of um, history from my perspective because, like I said, you would never know by looking at his account. No, because I was I've always known for doing these fakes. awesome renders. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's literally all all you see on his IG. You would never know that there was uh, there was you know some actual figs made there. But uh, uh, but yeah, <laughs> funny enough, um, the first fig um, that I bought from him, the Green Arrow, it never actually arrived. So uh, he sent a replacement, and that never arrived either. So he sent the third one. And about six months after that third one arrived, the other two showed up. <laughs> oh, at least that's your that's your story. You're sticking with it. I that's guess. my story. Yeah, I just wanted <laughs> I just wanted three green arrows because I'm known for hoarding. Uh, you know the same thing over and over again. But uh... <laughs> gotta stick gotta stick to the same story. Here, graphics. I've always enjoyed. I've always I've been following him for a while. I've always enjoyed his renders because he started emulating the uh, yeah, he fantastic. started emulating the '90s uh, Jim Lee tra- X Men trading card set. And they, uh, it's just so cool because I, I still have my my cards from that set. So and he nailed the, the aesthetics of them perfectly. He's awesome. Lego should hire that guy. Seriously. For oh, yeah, ad. definitely. And it's a shame. He only so wait, real quick. So Brick Hero Graphics, all one word, no fancy spelling, just Brick Hero Graphics, all one word. It's a shame. He only has currently four point eight thousand followers. And for the work this guy puts into things, it should be way more. Way more Way in the tens of yeah. thousands. So I will link to him in the show notes. He deserves a special shout out. One thing we did skip over as well is uh, in regards to quality and improvement with print and such. Because if you look at even earlier Christo figs back in the day, you'll see there's a difference in the print quality even then. So, you know, what, what's uh, what's your take on that, uh, Ed, about the quality and how it's increased and improved over time? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think we started out the evolution. If it was, you know, the, there's that classic graphic where you have the caveman and then you walk upright in the beginning it was just like actual mocks where people would just do decals and throw a few pieces together before there were then digital print or uv print that as you mentioned penzora was like it was so grainy but they did characters that you could just never get anywhere else so actually you know i threw down for some of those and then pad print obviously is now the standard and now we've got custom pieces. But all along that way, you've seen just the quality going just ever higher. Um, but looking back, yeah, the, the the quality was very suspect. But I also think that's the reason why, you know, brands like Christo still remains to this day. Adam has always been a, a stickler for quality for his releases. Um, and so it's the brands, I think, that are really thoughtful about, you know, quality control. I think that's going to last and that's a quick point of clarity when we refer to adam we're referring as a brand we're talking about phoenix customs for those who may not know we have familiar ties with some of these folks so we do tend to resort to first names you know like andrew is minifigures.co.uk adam is phoenix customs and we'll, we'll try and clarify that in the future ahead of time Definitely. And funny enough, that has actually technically now lead us into uh, the next section you want to talk about with the C&D debacle. Uh, so um, funny enough, at a certain point, we had to start adopting um, the acronyms for the brands like PCB, uh, for Phoenix Custom Bricks, uh, Muddy River, Muddy Figures, MRM. We really didn't do that much prior to something that happened uh, in the old Flickr days, which was that one of the brands, and if I remember correctly, I believe it was Eclipse Graphics, received a cease and desist letter. Now, um, a lot of secrecy around it. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, everything was a bit more secretive back uh, back in the Flickr days. Even brands were more secretive about their uh, their processes and such. So you couldn't get a lot of information. But I understand that um, uh, Victor received a C and D, and at that point, then it just sent the entire scene into a panic. And for a while, we weren't even sure this scene that we all had recently sort of found. Uh, we weren't sure if it was going to even continue. Uh, do you remember that that period, Ed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, it was. There wasn't a lot of transparency around, you know, the releases, who was behind who. Um, what I remember about Eclipse Graphics is, you know, he had he attracted me because he did the lineup of X Men figs, right? The Rogue, the Cyclops. Um, I think he did a Beast. I had no idea Eclipse had done a line of X Men figs. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, he did he very rogue, yeah. Cyclops, and uh, Storm. Uh, and I think he did. Storm, he did right. Professor X, but it wasn't actually a custom. It was just a custom chair and a Lego torso, um, like a, like a bath. It was, you know, that he sold. Um, he was going to do a Beast, but the Beast never actually came to being, unfortunately, because for a long time he sort of moved away from superheroes altogether. You know. 
Yeah, he was supposed to send me one of those prints of the 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 hair, the, you know, the beast hair, the one that uh, is on the Logan hair, and do the blueprint on the sides. And I yeah, never ended up getting yeah. that one. But at any rate, he did yeah, but the season digital instead of pad though because the early ones were pad weren't they but he did eventually come out about five years after he stopped making them and i think he made a, a beast fig then but it wasn't the same design that he originally planned he did have a banner on his site once and there was a picture of the beast there and it's quite similar to the muddy river figs one now actually so i think it's game based props that's right yeah so you know back, going back to the the question i think um it did put a pause on you know whether or not this was going to be back then if you dial back the clock we were wondering, wow, geez, is that kind of the end now of kind of IP or licensed products that are outside of, yeah, you know, yeah. officially, you know, licensed stuff? But you know, I think we've more than powered through here. <laughs> so oh, uh, that was just the yeah, first. I mean, I, like I said, I, I remember at the time the brands were really scrambling a lot, and a lot of them were saying, "I'm not sure if I'm going to continue," you know, and obviously that had everyone in disarray because we were used to getting our monthly fix of figs at that point, weren't we? You know, um, so yeah, it was just a strange time. But like I said, we had, we it probably seems silly now, but back then we wanted to still praise these brands without sort of drawing attention to them. So instead of tagging them, you'd say, "Oh, this is um, Carnage by MRM instead of Muddy River Mini Figures or whatever," you know. Um, so that's how we 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 tried to uh, sort of adapt to it, you know. But uh, which is funny because now that's become the abbreviations have become the, the common vernacular a co complex yeah complex yeah i know it is crazy and also just to share with everybody this is the reason why you, we've had to come up with all these creative names we didn't use the official names like i and behind the scenes i'm sure all of us have helped pitch in at least on a lot i'm not going to say name names but yeah i've helped to probably name some of these some better than others i would say in terms of character names without using the official names. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and let me tell you, I've only done it maybe a I've only contributed a few times, only quote unquote one one time, but it's not easy. <laughs> they they get into rhythm. Like Adam's got, you know, Phoenix Customs has got his, you know, arachnid after everything or thunderer after everything. So they they eventually Galactic before with the Star Wars. Galactic this, galactic that. For the Miles 2020, I was just like 2020 arachnid. That's just all I could think of. <laughs> hey, it, it works. Like, we were like, we were like Daft Punk arachnid, like, you know, do arachnid. We were like Beat Drop arachnid. We, we, I, I came up with like twenty different names. I was like, yeah, we just call it twenty twenty. It's pretty nice to be asked to, to input, give input, though, isn't it? I, I, I've never been asked to give input. I was just lucky enough that I won the, um, the competition to name Adams a soccer fake. <laughs> But uh, that that was just pure, you know, luck. That was at the end of the day. But yeah, that's really cool if people are actually hitting you up and asking you know, what do you think you should call it. Yeah, so like that goes back to like Arachno Girl for that that I did with uh, with Br uh, Ramon Bricks Raminator. Yeah, one of my don't worry, we will definitely be covering that, Ed. Don't yeah, you don't jump the script, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, sorry guys, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so there were a lot of brands back then, but a lot of them have not survived. I know folks like an ACM we talked about with the bootlegs, you know, kind of frustrated them out of the game, and then. Pop Punk Monkey kind of moved on. Most of most of their designs got sent over to uh, were adopted by Big Kid Bricks, and he's made his own individual tweaks to them. Some of them are, are one for ones, but he's made tweaks over time and did additional versions. And some of them are giving a resurgence, like Muddy Rivers back, Online Sailing or OLS, as some people call him. He disappeared for a while. He's been back intermittently re in recent history, printing and posting on eBay. He doesn't seem to do any new designs anymore, though. He's just re, re, sort of reprinted old ones by the looks of it. So I wonder if it is even the same guy. Well, no, it's the same guy because uh, he he was going to sell off his stuff. My understanding, he was going to sell off his printer, but the deal decided, and I know to who, but it just didn't happen. The deal fell through for whatever reason, and he started printing again. And I understand he was, some folks have contacted him about commissions, but of course you can't just order one or two figs. You got to order in bulk. So Either either people have had to um, get dedicated promises that they would pay or get the money up front to get those orders fulfilled. But um, I actually have, I'm actually missing two online sale and figs from the Spidey collection. Um, there was a Venom that he made that is very hard to find. And there is a, um, he did two, well, I thought two. It turns out he did three versions of Ben Riley Scarlet Spider. Yeah, I was about to say, he did a bunch of those. Like I have the light blue version that he and that's did that's the one i'm missing but the pod one the first one so i have the dark blue version that he did but then he also did another version with a different head that i only recently discovered in conversations 
because I thought it was um, I thought it was a uh, um, Calypso. He showed it to me and he found the, the product shop from Online Salem, and it matched. Yeah, he t- he does these some he t- sometimes does these um, off the off the run kind of variants like this Namor that he did. That oh, the one you've been me, looking for. <laughs> Namor. Yeah, yeah, it's different. I don't know if I'll ever look for that, find that one because there's the main one, and everybody sends me the main one. But he did do a slightly different variant version of that one maybe it was oh, just is that like limiter. one with um his chest clothing was like held together by string with one design but not with another it's or sleeves like that, the difference of sleeves I, right the sleeves yes different sleeve and then i think the face was uh, the head so you want different. the name more with the with the sleeves i need to go double okay, check well, my, my guy i have to like well you got a captured audience that. right now this is uh, not time to put it out there man <laughs> i think if it's a sleeve one, I've got, I've got the sleeve one, but you're not having it, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll put that out on on one of your geek exchanges soon. So I actually have eBay alerts set up for online sale, and I must get daily pings every time there's new stuff listed or relisted. During the last geek exchange, I noticed there was a resurgence of a lot of people trying to collect old OLS figs, which kind of threw me off. As things have gotten really complicated in printing and techniques, like you were mentioning earlier, I think there's been a push for a lot of the newer collectors that still want to hang on to the Lego aesthetic. They're actually seeking out the older figs that were much more simple in their design. Perhaps the price is a point as well, though, because they're a bit more of an entry level. They price, definitely are they? entry level price make, uh... Um, because there's not all these molded parts and magnets and all. You know, we we went from classic level simple prints, and I remember when I remember when UV reactive prints were like the biggest thing in the world. Oh yeah. And now it's like, oh yeah, that's cool. Whatever. Now it's like, well, have you seen these magnets? <laughs> have you seen these uh, size up part, molded parts to make your figure bigger or whatever? I don't know what he's like to do with now, but I'll be honest with you. Back in the day, um, John, his name was uh, OLS. He was he was the nicest guy. He was just so nice to deal with, so accommodating and so helpful. So it was uh, it was a really it was a really sad sort of time when he uh, sort of pulled out of the scene. Um, and I think he did so because he uh, he was having some issues with his job or he was moving on to another job or something and he'd have time for it, you know. So it was really good when he came back. But uh, it's just a shame we don't see new designs from him, to be honest with you. But uh, funny enough, he is going to be mentioned now in this next section, which uh, is what I've referred to as the period of scamming. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel, I'm sorry. I feel like I should put some sort of like law and order, like doom, doom. After that, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this could be a whole new a separate episode, to be honest. We're touching on a lot of different stuff, but yeah, we, let's get into it. It's fine. I mean, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to need your help to fill in some of the blanks here because I did take a bit of a hiatus from collecting for around 18 months. And and it was sort of um, towards the end of this period. Now, this new guy basically joined the scene. Um, he started off. Because we, we well, basically we say new guy. They were about ten accounts, weren't there, Ed? It was, uh, you know, it, it, we we assumed it was the same guy because you would always see the same sort of um, inflection and wording, you know, yep. uh, with how he yep. was writing. Uh, but he basically started off as a as a designer for Pop Punk Monkey, and literally every post you went, you would go on for any brand's release, he would be in that post talking shit about this brand, saying how his designs are superior, uh, how he had been a um, in the pad printing business for years. And no matter what you said, no matter who challenged him, including people like Victor, who had also been doing pad printing and, and print work for a long time, he always had an answer to everything anyone said, and he always was superior. Um, he got people's backs up in a big, big way. And... Uh, you know, some of the conversations got really dark because he, he he didn't seem very so, stable. Well, I'm sorry, um, but were his comments educated? Like, or was he just talking out his ass and I had no idea what he was talking about? I would say that he definitely did have a background. He definitely did. And like I said, the reason I'm saying he, that is because yeah. he did actually do some designs for OLS as well. He did become OLS's designer for a while. So he, he did have um, certainly design knowledge. And like I said, it, it's believed that he had worked in pad printing uh, for many years. Um, but it, I mean, basically, put it this way: right? you, you'd you'd be on a PCB post, and he would be trying to say how the pop punk monkey fig he designed last week is better than a PCB, and uh, you know, pop punk monkey served its purpose at the time, but there was no world where that was a correct statement. You know, it's not it's not even down to choice. It's just you're looking at a, a digitally printed fig with grain so high you could file your nails with it. 
Um, and he's saying that this PCB fig, which is vibrant and beautifully pad printed, oh, it's it's not as well done, you know. Uh, and it was always that case, no matter what fig it was. If it wasn't a fig he'd been involved in, it was shit, basically, you know. Um, and then suddenly this brand pops up with a guy saying very similar stuff, but now it's an actual name brand called Cyclops Bricks. Mm -hmm. so there's past. a collective groan yes, yes. across the customs community <laughs> of, the, of the older collectors is, yeah. right now. Anyone... I've heard you just heard you say that. Yeah. Now, anyone in the olden days obviously will, will know very well this about this. Before my time, as but I even said... I know this story. <laughs> yeah. Now, as I said earlier, I've always been suspicious of new brands. It takes me a while to warm up to, to anything new, uh, you know, like that. So I was always a little bit wary of this guy. Um, I do have two of his figs, but they, luckily they're some of the few that were actually made. Um, because this guy started off by releasing a couple of nice figs. He did, um, I think, Deathstroke from Arrow. Um, he did a couple of, um, I think he did an Earth 2 Superman as well. Um so, you know, he did release some figs. They were very nice pad printed figs, very, very simple, but we're talking sort of crystal level and maybe even a bit more um, uh, sort of detailed, uh, some of the designs. And then uh, suddenly he goes on an absolute bender, um, uh, sort of dropping renders, um, left, right and center. And he starts doing a lot of pre-orders. And the funny thing is, more and more of these designs keep popping up and more and more pre-orders keep popping up. And it gets to a point where people people are absolutely rabid for these figs as well. They were they were so nice at the time that everyone was just in love with them, you know. And he he totally swept got them all swept up, you know. And was this um, was this one of the first instances where pre orders started occurring? They did happen a little bit. I think um, I think we did have a couple of brands doing it, but this this I think is where it really first started. To be honest with you, but, you know, when it became such a, a normal model. Um, but yeah, I mean, it went on for months and months, and more and more pre-orders and yet no delivery of uh, uh of any of any of these figs uh people started getting suspicious started chasing um this guy was still about in his various accounts uh arguing with everyone uh you know there was one account where he just was abusive uh there was another account like say when he was the expert knew everything and then there was the cyclops bricks account then which he basically i think he was just probably not answering anyone i mean this, this like i said this is the spot now this is the bit where i get a bit spotty on this because i hadn't pre-ordered anything I'd only ordered the ones that he actually released to, to hook people in to begin with. Um, so I, I, you know, luckily for me, but not for everyone else, obviously, um, you know, there were people suddenly waiting around and they were, you know, they were talking about crystal levels of waiting here, you know, uh, getting to a certain point. So, I mean, did you order anything, Ed? Was, he was a lot of DC's figs, so I'm not sure if he did Marvel much. I think he did um, Daredevil, didn't he? So I have my, I've been waiting to tell this story, um, Brett, you, you might not have heard this one. So, uh OLS um Phil if you remember did this contest um where we did um you know, submissions for comic book covers um right. was, think, that, was that the one with the Batman was given away there were three Batman, Batman things Bla with? that's that's right Blackest Night Batman which I didn't really I didn't really care about that one but I came in second with my um Infinity Gauntlet um, I spent so much time on that, by the way, probably too much time. So uh, there was something to show for it. But what I remember about that was, um, yeah, Cyclops was a co-sponsor of that because I guess he had some connection with, with OLS. He designed the fig. He designed it. Oh, uh, but, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I wouldn't know because I didn't really care about it. <laughs> but, no. no. Um, the, 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 and so, yes, I came in second place to Andrew um the other andrew the photographer um he he did i can't remember which one he did but he 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 placed first yeah that's right he he did i think a flash one or something like that he was always like my dc nemesis it's kind of choking but anyway um uh, he was like a very dc centric guy which is you know i think he's embraced a lot of marvel stuff which is great because he's such an amazing photographer i want to give a shout out to, to andrew from back in the day definitely he's an amazing photographer but you know what's funny that uh, just to wrap on Cyclops, he sent me some prototypes of because remember he had a huge plan of a bunch of stuff like Iron Fist. Um, it was with a Daredevil with a cowl, wasn't it? An actually custom made cowl. cowl, I think. And protos were made for it, but they they didn't look as good as people were expecting, if I remember correctly. It wasn't that great, but I, in fact, I actually ended up. If you go back to my Flickr. Fo um stream like he sent me one of the iron fist cows which was like you know how like 
when the 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 actual like the prototypes are like an orange color it wasn't painted yeah. and it was really like the fit wasn't great but like back then i was like all geeked out about it because there weren't a lot of custom parts so i definitely you know got my file out and sh- shaped it and put it on the official like iron man or even if there wasn't an official one i think i had an L- a leo one so i was really excited about the the whole you know, release a fix that he was going to come up with. Little did I know that it was a rug pull, and a lot of people like were, yeah, taken by that. You've actually got my memory. Yeah, those custom parts were what got people so excited. I think actually because they were. I mean, at the time, he, he was the name. Everyone wanted a part, a piece of him. You know, it was uh, it was crazy how how well he sort of suckered everyone in. Um, but the other day, good designs. I mean, I mean that's going to happen, isn't it? You know. But um, th- I mean, there are some people. Even to this day, you mentioned Cyclops bricks. Even now, to some people from from back those days, like uh, Corto, for example, um, Slade X yes. Wilson. Yeah, yes. you mentioned it to them, and it, and you know, you you can imagine their face dropping. You know, <laughs> you'd have to see them to know it's, but it's crazy. But yeah, this guy, he just he, he did. He scammed a ton of people. So that was another dark period. I think scamming still a problem to this day. But it's really, you just got to educate yourself. Like you said, be hesitant of new brands. Cyclops Bricks, he did come back a couple of times as other brands yep. as well. Uh, yep. So yeah, that's something we didn't touch on. Yeah. And now, I I mean, I, I'm, I'm loath to whether or not we should even say it because it's not 100% certain, but we do believe um, a different minifigure was Cyclops Bricks. Really? It but could have been, yeah. Sure. He, came, he came in and then came out. Well, he only made two figs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They were because they they're both spidings. Figs, he... Oh, there were three. There were three figs, I think. Actually, there was um, end of day Spidey. There was the oh, what's the what if story Bruce where Bruce Banner, Banner becomes yeah. Spidey? Yeah, is he, oh, is he just called Bruce? Yeah, he did that, and he did um, Ronin fig, didn't he? He did a Ronin. Fig. Oh, that's right, he did do a Ronin fig, and it wasn't a very good fig either, to be honest. It was terribly printed that thing. But um, but yeah, this but, but a lot of brands popped up and disappeared in very short periods of time. They always had very similar mos. They'd always get one fig out. And then start dazzling you with all these renders. And I think for a couple of years, everyone was just completely paranoid about whether or not it was Cyclops Brick coming back, you know, the revenge. <laughs> yeah, there there are a few brands, right. I think. we could, Again, we can only speculate, and I don't want to... I'm not a fan of talking about anything that I can't back up with fact, but, or at least we yeah, yeah. preclude with saying, you know, we can't confirm, at least, is like, yeah, there are a couple of brands out there where... They just popped up, they released the fig, and they disappeared. It could have been a matter of, hey, they just really like that character and want to make that one fig, or they just didn't make enough sales and they, they toppled over. Yeah. Like Unicorn, right? They made Taskmaster, and they made a Thanos. And then what else? Well, I think even Taskmaster was a life brick collaboration, wasn't it? I think it might have been. I, I'm not sure. But the, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of these random brands that came in and i can see why phil you're wary of like new brands because you never know if they're going to stick around you don't know what like it's you can it's easy to put out a prototype or you know design certainly nowadays it's so easy to put out a design and this will lead into i'm sure we'll get into it later but remember cyclops probably was the first instance of understanding the dynamic of a getting hype um you know creating hype and releasing uh, just enough uh, to get people interested and to, to open up their wallets, and then the whole pre-order and saying, "Oh yeah, I've got to get on this this FOMO," and then hoovering up a bunch of cash and then just disappearing into the night, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I, it did. I mean, I, I honestly think it did affect the community for a very long time. I think that even bled over into Instagram a little bit, to be honest with you. I mean, I was a little bit behind some people migrating across. Um, and funny enough, that's going to be our next uh, topic now. Actually, is the uh, the great the internet has a short memory because there are brands out there right now that I literally count that they have no less than forty five pre orders existing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be wrong. You can, you can have a trusted person who's going to just string you along forever. And you know, no, in that, and that brand's defense, they, they are the delivering. Thing. It's just some some much faster than parts. Yeah. Some things much faster than others, but there is some that you can trust to deliver, even if it takes forever. 
yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, but yeah, that that mistrust, you know, I think actually even to even to this day now, when a new brand shows up, I'm still really wary. It's only because usually you've got um, you know, like back in the Flickr days, we didn't really have as many resellers. Sometimes you were just buying directly from an individual on Flickr. So I think uh, resellers have helped in a, in a lot of respects because if the reseller uh is is um is is selling that figure on, then there's that extra element of trust and perhaps even that extra cushion of safety for you as well if things did go to shit. Uh, it's not nice for the reseller, I know, but obviously as the end uh, user of the product, you know, I suppose it is nice to have that safety cut in it. Yeah. Some resellers will actually sell your figs for you, but they'll take a cut. You know, you have to work that arrangement out with them and yeah. you should have to establish a relationship with them because selling as an individual, as someone who hosts now a secondhand market through the Geek Exchange, and uh, I help admin a few groups, the challenge as a as a seller, as an individual is earning the trust of the buyer that friends and family is going to be okay. Because speaking from the West, starting this, this tax season coming up, um, although my wife, we just talked about this, my wife said we pay taxes on my PayPal income last year. And I don't remember. We're going to start paying taxes on whatever we earn through goods and service sales because it's considered additional income. So that's why you'll see a lot of sellers coming saying, hey, that's going to cost, you know, 55 even plus five dollars shipping friends and family and you know if you don't know that person you don't want to do that because you want buyer protection totally understandable but at the same time it's like yep. i want you to feel comfortable buying from me but i also don't want to have to pay taxes on this money that i'm making off this fig right now especially when a lot of times right. i know me personally a lot of times i sell my figs at cost because i just want to get rid of them or at the most maybe a 20 percent uptake but still at a very good price compared to most and then to make that money back, trying to sell these figs to pay for other figs. But then later on, I have to pay taxes on that shit too. That's ridiculous. So you're going to start seeing a lot more people depending on that trust because because I'm telling you, I, I would prefer everyone pay me friends and family just so I don't have to pay taxes on it. And a side note on, on Should I PayPal put that on a podcast? Just, I don't know. Is that going to count against me legally? <laughs> <laughs> if the IRS no, but, but, are listening, don't, don't uh, ignore everything. <laughs> you could put, put put the edit. This might go into edit. But I, I will say this. I mean, PayPal is a perfect example where there's such a great opportunity for – in PayPal is like the way – the margins that they get, I think uh, all of us use it. But it's just crazy how we haven't have a better solution than PayPal, to be honest. Well, that and um, the dangers of PayPal, even with the goods and services, is that window of opportunity you have to request a refund on a failed delivered product when pre-orders can take anywhere yep. from three to four months. You're well beyond the window of getting a refund. Yeah, so I actually had somebody come up to me two days ago because they were in a situation where they they mailed a fig out, they got the money, the post office said delivered, but the guy's like, I didn't get it. And he's like, well, I don't know what to do in this situation. I'm like, well, did you take it? Did you do what I told you to do with sales? And he's like, yep. He had a picture of the box with all the postage labels on it. He had his receipt showing he'd mailed it. He's got the tracking number that was legit and showed it was delivered. I'm like, dude, you've done all you can do. If he didn't get it, he needs to go to the post office and they can geolocate where that package is and where it was dropped off and delivered. And the guy didn't do it. He just kept saying, no, you owe me a refund. I'm like, dude, he's trying to scam you. And even if he's not, you have no way of proving otherwise. At, at the most, you could do is maybe give him a partial refund. But I've seen that happen a few times where people say, oh, I didn't get it. Well, look, I did all, I did right by you. I did everything here. Here's the box that the, with all the stickers from the post office on it. Every time I ship something, I always take a picture of the box. I take a pictures of the customs form. Uh, so that they can see it's been filled out the way it's supposed to be. And I cover my ass because, you know, as much as we talk about seller scamming, there are buyers that will try and scam as well. Definitely. I'll be honest, I've used the friends and family a lot more in the last 18 months or so, but it's very much a case of reputation when it comes to to me. Uh, you know, if, if, if I know a person is well known within the community or I know they dealt with a friend, for example, that, then that's a, you know, that's a green flag to go, you know, but I would definitely be wary of it if it's a brand new person that I've not had any sort of interaction with and none of you guys some have, countries you know? don't have a friends and family option ah they don't yeah they don't in singapore yeah. i haven't come across that at yep. all christ I, like i'm lucky because i have like if i want to do it i have a u.s paypal account so i'll use it for that but yeah in in singapore there's no friends and family option so get yourself a vpn <laughs> that's the that's the bottom line here <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so you had a few scams going on, and I'm sure there were others involved. We can talk all night about it. Yeah. 
No, we, we have got to move on, definitely. <laughs> there was a point where things moved off of Flickr and Instagram, Instagram became the norm like it is today. What exactly spurred that? Well, just before that, we had the explosion of brands from the East come in. Um, and uh, the scene the scene just massively uh, exploded. It got so much bigger. Um, I think it started probably with, um, uh, well, Lay Lay to a certain degree. Is, it, they is that the quite, same as Lyle, um, Lyle, Lyle, Lyle Brick, what I call Lyle Brick? Uh, yeah, Lay Lay Brick. Sorry, L Y L. L Y L as everyone uh, does the abbreviation. I'm so glad um, my so, yeah, phone so, auto completes uh, that now. <laughs> try and try to instead of trying to spell it every time. But uh, but obviously you had this you had this brand suddenly pushing out digital figs at a pace that we'd never seen, and then I think um, it spurred other brands to come along like Diamond Custom Bricks. I remember they were still uh, they were starting out um, just before I sort of went on a bit of a hiatus from collecting, and um, I think the last brand that I saw. Um, I think I actually was on hiatus at this point, but I was still stalking now and again. You know, um, was Life Brick. But uh, but yeah, we had we had this just massive sudden interest from the east come in, and a bunch of brands just cropped up overnight. It felt like almost um, again, like I said, I I I sort of missed a lot of this. So so, what would your take be on this, Ed? Let's dial back the clock a little bit. If you remember. Um... The, re- the reason why, at least one of the, the reasons why there was this migration from Flickr to Instagram was they started putting a limit on uh, – Flickr started putting a limit. I think I can't remember what, what it was. Yeah, the amount, how much amount, you of could folk, amount of posts. Yeah, you had to go for premium if you wanted to get more than a certain amount. That's right. So they, they went to this revenue model, and then everybody was just saying, well, forget that. And then IG, I just went back on, on my um, – stream saying you know is instagram the future please read you know i'm i'm gonna future proof this account by going over to ig um and yeah like i think i didn't look back after that after a while in fact you know i i was speaking to a bunch of people i, I remember speaking to to adam about it pcb about hey listen you probably should should do that as well you know at some stage and he he wasn't like he didn't really it was i think we were still trying to hold on to the kind of community feel but that kind of went away but to, to pivot back to the to the uh, brands coming out from the east that lyl certainly is the first brand that came out i think with quality right because we they were more associated with the bootleg quality right that's what everybody had had imagined if it was coming out from the east that it was um bootleg quality it was like a last resort if you wanted to get a certain variant or something but LYL actually came out with really high quality prints, um, and I think one of their first big hits was the the um, SDCC. Yeah, those were pad. Um, yeah, yeah, they did those were pad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. pad SEC of the Amazing Spider-Man fig and the uh, Black Symbiote suit and Spider Woman. That's right, Spider Woman. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, they did the um, New York 25 figs as well. Yeah, the only they? one they did not do That's right. is the recent Miles Sony's PlayStation suit. I wish they did. I wish they did that. Well, there's a, I've got there's one a printed by Bad Bricks, <laughs> designed by Bob Customs, who did a great job. And actually, you know, I was actually very impressed with uh, Bad Bricks' UV, but I was actually very impressed with the print on it. Yeah, good guy. Bob Bricks. Fabric's print is like OLS level yeah. print, uh, which is really, really high quality digital. You know, it's fantastic stuff. Brick Sanity, before he got out of doing hero stuff, he actually also used Bob's design and did a uh, print on a glow to dark fig, the Miles Sony uh, uh, design, which is really cool. So I have that one as well. So I've got a, a glow in the dark version, and then I've got the actual black version that mirrors the, the official fig. But they're both, again, they're both UV. Yeah, but just to, just to finish up on this thought here, I think that was the first brand that established, you know, pretty decent, high quality. I was branching out into to figs that, you know, or characters that nobody else kind of did. You could almost call them like uh, Pop and K Monkey 2.0. That was very, very high quality in terms of expanding the universe of characters. Um, oh, yeah. And it was that's... like they were on steroids, wasn't it? They, 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 there's hundreds of designs out there, aren't and, there? And they, were, they dug deep into comic lore as well. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I've got a drawer full of their Spideys now, and no one else has ever made any of those. You know what I mean? And they're all uh, they're all pretty the obscure. Lyle Brick, the Lyle Brick Spidey hole gets goes deep. And even recently, I've got two 
two figs that came out of nowhere. I don't know who made them. Vinny Legogo found them for me. Um, it's a black symbiote suit, but with the blue accents, like the comic draw illustration. And one is a black and white version of the PlayStation suit. And even though we haven't seen these anywhere else, described anywhere else, listed anywhere else, it was a private collector that commissioned them. I I put them side by side with Lyle Brick, and I think they're the ones who made them. It's it's funny you do get some figs like that mystery figs though. Um, actually, I I tell I told you earlier when I said I didn't have any Grail figs. I do have a couple of Grail figs that I sort of forgot about until just a second. But they're, they're OLS figs, and one of them was OLS Nobu. Um, and I I remember my first interaction with Ling, uh, you know, L one N six minifigures was buying some of his second hand figs, and um, one of those was the um, Suicide Squad Katana. Uh, so that was OLS as well, and that was one of my Grail figs. So I picked that up. Uh, I think I picked up another fig, and then I picked up what I thought was um, OLS Nobu. But when it came in, it was not OLS at all. It only had um, boot print on the front, for example, instead of on the sides as well. Uh, so I messaged him on it, and he thought it was OLS as well. It was a com- complete mistake on his part, you know, an accident. But um, but yeah, this fig, never been able to identify it. And I think I did actually put it uh, to you guys in the past when I received it, because this was about three, four years ago now. Nothing but, uh, even on, like, yeah, Hero Blocks, that old website? No, nothing on Hero Blocks, no. I, I spent weeks trying to find information, looking at old people, uh, posts from old accounts and that. Never found out where this came from. So you do get these random pop-ups. And I suppose with digital, you can get a, a smaller run at a cheaper price. So I suppose it's possible someone commissioned it at some Yeah, point. well, you talked about pop-up brands before on the Flickr days. Nowadays, uh, we've no, got a no, lot no, of pop-up no, like commissions. And, and you've got yeah, these yeah. shops that are now, you know, pimping themselves out to anybody so like people are like they like they name a brand they just make something up they make a logo all they're doing is commissioning established UV brands to print for them and they're calling it their own. I think this this big might have been like an early early version of that, you know. But uh, but yeah, it's it's just crazy how many are actually out there. You know, we we consider ourselves fairly knowledgeable about the scene in general and about releases. But there's always these things. That I'm not knocking the, the practice. I'm just saying that's the reality. Is you've got a lot of folks that are like the people tell me like, oh, did you see this Spidey? I'm like, no, I haven't. Oh, but I know who's printing that, and I don't prefer to buy from that individual, you know, so that that particular brand. But even though it's coming being sold by somebody else, it was designed by somebody else. I know who the printer is, so I know it's not the quality that I prefer or the individual I wish to support. It's impossible. I, that's why um, mid early to mid this year, I swore off chasing every single Spidey I come across and focusing simply on Pad because with the amount of pop up shots happening now, there's no way to keep up. Th Bricks. I want to say he's out of Korea. He's taking a break. Yeah, Korea. He's, he's 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 left the game for a while for whatever reason. He was printing a new Spidey every week and a new version of the same Spidey every week. And I've actually got a PowerPoint slide, and I'll share it to you later. But no joke, there's at least fifty, maybe sixty Spideys on this slide, and it's all like version one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, with like subtle differences in the eyes or the chest or the way or how heavy the print was on the <laughs> webbing. Ed mentioned the uh, evolution chart earlier. It'd be good to get those just so we could do an evolution chart picture yeah, or something. Yeah, and, and so I was just like, I was like, there's just, there's just, just no way. There's just no way I'll be able to. I got all the older generation UV stuff. I'm like, there's no way I can keep up with this modern era. No way. Well, it's good to hear that uh, you're not getting every single Spidey now. I mean, it's, uh, I, I was feeling for you for a little well, while. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's not like I got a break too. right now. <laughs> just as, as No Way Home was like settling on the horizon. Spider Verse pops up. <laughs> so it's like yeah. so. Someone said earlier they're like talking a, about uh, like Phil. You're talking about 2099. I was like, wait, do you mean Mini Gazer, Life Brick, Jin, Cross Check? <laughs> Which one are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, I'm not as deep in the hole as you anyway with Spideys. But even even me from No Way Home, I, I think I've said it on the podcast before. But I am absolutely sick of the sight of Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire at this point. <laughs> I'm scared of what I'll do if I ever see these people in real life. <laughs> <laughs> They've cost me so much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cross the Spider Verse. I mean, that there's a there's just a gold mine for for somebody who wants to, to get into so many characters that was on you know that was in that film, right? Oh yeah, there's actually there's actually an artist. Uh, let me see if I can. I'll look through Instagram while we're talking, but and I might just sporadically announce his name. It's a guy I follow that he draws nothing. He does a different drawing of different spiders from the Spider-Verse. He finds the most obscure stuff. Like he'll do the action figures that were made, like Hydro Blast Spider-Man and like, he'll, and oh, like all these other, that's awesome, all this other crazy <laughs> shit. And it's just, 
you know, today Christo, today Christo showed off uh, a new Spidey coming, and I honestly had no idea what the suit was from until Ed, you, I didn't yeah, track that down. Yeah, no, I appreciate. It. Well, I didn't think to look into the cartoon lore, but yeah, the, I yeah. saw you post that, and I spent forty five minutes looking for it myself, and I couldn't find. It. I came back to the group chat, and oh, you've answered yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah, wasted well, the synthetic minutes. symbiote suit, which was just basically black and green. Yeah, that was horrible. <laughs> I just struck out because this guy's got like. 300 different spiders he's already drawn and that one was not in there so i was like oh my god what is happening here i'm dying yeah you actually they keep you up and i thinking, what if he starts making these oh my god things? you have no idea no. <laughs> oh because that's what everybody wants right they want like one of every fig or whatever every suit or whatever but uh i've got i've got about 15 14 or 15 bootleg spidey figs that i want made into printed on official lego parts whether it's UV or pad, I don't give a shit at this point. They're all low key like suits that aren't very visually interesting or no one cares about. It's like, oh, House of M Spider Man. Like no one cares what that what that looks like. You know, it's I don't know. Is um into the Spider Verse sort of cro- crossing some of those off the list by chance though? Like um I know Spider Man Unlimited is in in, in yes. across the Spider Verse. Yes, isn't he? there so are there are brands there are brands later, eyeing okay. Spectacular Spider Man, which has been a very hot button item. Um, AV Figures actually did a digital p- printed version recently, but there are other pad printer, uh, printing companies that are, are eyeing Spectacular Spidey, so I know that will be widely received. Tumaneo, or uh, Micro Mises website, did a Cyborg Spider Woman. So it's not quite the comic Cyborg Spidey, but it's still a really cool sculpt that um, I haven't quite picked up yet, but he knows I want it. And then um, Ultimate Spider-Man, yeah, Cheeseburger and Sand Green minifigures are are doing the Ultimate Spider-Man or Spider-Man Unlimited, excuse me, from the cartoon. And I only have a I only had a bootleg of that and another mystery brand fig, which again, we have no idea who printed it. So yeah, that's exciting. But you know, with that, of course, we've got a bunch of Miles and Gwens and twenty ninety nine. So okay, well, okay, so that's enough about Spideys. I digress. Um, back to the Flickr migration. So we said there was um. They were putting limits. They're making a crap. So everyone started moving over to Instagram. Yeah. Um, my understanding was that it was a really big uh, point of contention for the creators, especially because they felt like they were suddenly not going to get as much exposure to their work and they didn't want to pay for premium, which I think was the the push. I'm not sure if it was um, Flickr being taken over by another company or something or just changing policy. But but yeah, but like I said, I was on a bit of a hiatus during this time, so I only really caught the tail no, That was bit, around but, what, um, 2016, right? Yeah, yeah, about 2016, that's right, yeah. So, uh, obviously, by the time I sort of caught up with Insta uh, after my hiatus, then obviously everyone had joined in, but it was just amazing to see the difference, you know? It's just a much more close-knit community here. Um, A big part of that, I believe, is group chats. I think it's one thing when you're having DMs with individuals like we did in the Flickr days, but when you've got the ability to actually have a a, a group session with people, it is really... uh, it, it, you, people open up more, I think. So, you know, so I, I, I do feel that it's, uh, it's a far more tight knit community here now than it ever was. And we, and don't be wrong, we had, we had a, you know, fairly tight knit community back in the Flickr days. They were, they were a good few of us. You know, um, Ed, like I said, uh, obviously we had Koto. Um, we stayed X Wilson Max. You know, he was around. I didn't really talk to him as much myself, but that's probably on me for being, um, being anti social git. You know, but, uh, um, but yeah, it, it, it changed massively. I, I, I found uh, with Instagram, it really was a bet the home for the scene yeah i i kind of I, I feel like we've been able to capture a lot of that phil you know in, in our group that we're in obviously bread has been such a great you know addition to that i mean i always like to say like you know if bread had discovered customs back in the day he definitely would have been you know one of the crew in, in Flickr, right oh, just, yeah. you know like <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Come on. hundred percent. I mean, same sensibilities, same sense of community. You know, we're all kind of supporting one another, we're all, you know, generally, you know, pretty, pretty selfless in terms of, you know, some of the stuff we really want to just watch the community grow. Um, and yeah, I, th- I think we, ha- we still have captured a lot of that despite obviously IG being such a big platform, but just in our chat group, you know, Cordo, you, you know, Slade, a lot of a lot of the guys that were that you know have carried over from Flickr. Yeah, our chat group, um, which I referred to in passing a few times here, I feel very fortunate to be a part of. <laughs> I've jokingly called it the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> 
called it the PCB church, you know, because we were also, you know, fond of Adam. We still are. Still are. Yeah. Yeah. The group chat has been fantastic to connect, to share ideas. And, you know, I know a lot of folks, the younger generations, I guess I call them, and I don't mean that by age. I mean that by, well, some of it by age, but some of it also by experience. You know, they've, they've gravitated toward Discord to conduct their group chats. I've seen the Discords. People send me screenshots all the time. There's some good pontificating and there's some healthy discussions, but I feel that, and I don't want to shit on anybody. If I were to go into those discords, I would have to go in anonymously because I feel like I'd find myself trying too hard to correct the record or fact check, and I'd probably be hated for it. See, I have a, I have a different issue. Right? Do I just, I'm an old man scared of new things. <laughs> oh, um, no, <laughs> I was on Discord when it first started. You know, we were uh, for, back in the gaming, my game, my heavy gaming days, I was on TeamSpeak, and then we went to Tr- Ventrilo, and then we went to, to Discord. And they're still on Discord, but I've, you know, I don't game as much as I used to. It's just it's a free for all public forum where I see a lot of perpetuation of false ideologies behind certain brands or miscommunications or what people want to perceive as inside knowledge or they plant seeds to make it come across as inside knowledge. And it's really not healthy. But those people, they don't usually last in the community, thankfully. It's, it's a very self regulated community. If you burn somebody or have sharp elbows, as I say, you tend to get ostracized pretty quickly. Yeah, I think one of one of the benefits of being on Instagram, being able to connect so well, is that you know the the, the bad seeds can get weeded out pretty quickly. Yeah, that's right. And I think you guys know, like I think everybody, I think one of the tenets of our community chat is just to just to respect one another. You know, just uh, we we all do this for fun. I mean, we, we I think ultimately we try to weed out just kind of just negativity. There's, there's enough negativity out there. If you really want to kind of go into the rabbit hole of being hypercritical and just being negative, you know, there's other places to do that ultimately. But yeah, I've, I've never really, you know, discord was never kind of my speed either for, and maybe that's, maybe I'm also showing my, my age there, but um, it just seemed a little chaotic um, and kind of disorganized in a way. I was just uh, sorry, I forgot. I realized uh, when I date myself um, before TeamSpeak, I was on X Fire, <laughs> which I'll, there may be some people here that remember that. I don't know, but um, yeah, I've never even heard that. And then it was IRC, <laughs> and then <laughs> IRC. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but you, know, really... you were saying about um, the, the need for anonymity. If you were in there, that does actually tie us in now perfectly to the next point. So, just like you said in the past, it is crazy how the conversation sort of leads into the next topic. Um, so, next topic, Ed, is influencer status or status, as you guys might say. Um, since migrating to Instagram, your page has really taken off. Uh, at last check, you had thirty five point three thousand followers. Uh, that's incredibly impressive for a niche community. Incredibly it's impressive. It's extremely impressive. Yeah, so how how did you go about accomplishing this? You know, I'm sure there are people who are interested in growing their page. Um, you know, what sort of things did you do, or or is it a is it a trade secret? No, I not at all. I mean, I think it was funny when I looked back and I checked when I migrated from Flickr to Instagram, and I just had I think I just had only two thousand followers on Flickr, but by the time I had gone over to Instagram, I had said, "Hey, this is kind of my I'm shifting over to Instagram." And I think I had some like 15,000 followers already, which was almost like a 10x of what I had um, of um, a Flickr. And, you know, I think for me, it was more like I really wanted to to share with the community what was possible, all the things that we were doing on Flickr. But it was such a it was such a larger platform. Um, but the challenge was it was a larger platform, meaning there was just so many varied interests on there, whereas Flickr was a community of photographers focused on like the Lego community was a very niche community. Um, And I wouldn't say that there was a niche community of Lego photographers in Instagram. I think we all have collectively helped to shape that in a way the migration certainly did um, from Flickr to Instagram. And we kind of all refound one another, but I was always about, again, assembling the most complete Marvel universe that I could and then sharing and connecting, um, uh, you know, sharing the the brands and what was possible. Um, I think the Hall of Armor and all the stuff that I'd done there, probably still to this day, is like one of the the most liked you know, posts that I have as a good reference. And I think Brett probably can appreciate this. Sometimes when we're going back on certain variants and things like that, people can use my 
page, almost like a, a Wikipedia page of what's out there, and at least in Marvel Customs, in terms of going all the way back to the past to the to now. I, I think I've featured pretty much all the major brands and all the major releases. Oh, absolutely. I've gone back to your page a number of times um, for reference. You and Jonathan or JN36 or J, J36 underscore N. Jonathan, also a massive collector. And I've gone back several times to, and soon saw as well. I would go back to um, the pages just to say, okay, who made this character? I mentioned this in a previous uh, episode talking to Azork about digital photography and, and the algorithm. And Four Bricks Tall, um, she put out a great blog talking about why certain posts take off more than others. And we always had this talk about white backgrounds and all that stuff. But it really comes down to easy to process information and why some folks will, rather than playing like a complex RPG on your phone, you're going to play something that's like one button push, like Candy Crush or something. It's just an easy thing to scroll, 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 like, scroll, like. And you posted, yeah, like you said, you basically were posting the MCU. You're like, you slap up the Incredible Hulk and then you have like a character representing everybody, you know, from that movie right across. So it's like, it's an easy reference point for collectors as well as just casual people that want to see what that would look like in Lego form. So I think that was definitely your, your stuff has a uh, broad appeal beyond just the custom collecting community. Yeah. I mean, I can also feel like um, the MCU taking off was also kind of a boon as well. Right. I think during that time period where people were rediscovering a lot of these stories that we were thick into, you know, both of us were anyway, before, you know, pre the MCU. Um, but yeah, the, that was a huge time where you know everything was like everything was Marvel all, all day all the time. So that was another kind of good timing, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, you came in at the right time for sure. And now everyone's like, "Oh, another Marvel post." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's gone. It's gone the other direction. I was surprised you haven't ended up losing thirty five point three k followers. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, we um we haven't really covered on it now, but um uh, as much as I thought we would have at this point, actually. But obviously, uh, in the process of doing this, you've created a lot of trust between yourself and many brands in this time that you've been on Instagram. Um, so it's led to you being the first point of contact for many brands for unveiling new releases. So how was how was that happen? Was that sort of a chicken egg scenario uh, with your exposure, uh, with you know the increase in your exposure, or or did these um, unveilings perhaps lead to further exposure for you? You know, it's funny because you know if I go back to without naming names, but one of the, I think every major brand that was pre Flickr, um, that is in the forefront today. If you go back. I think I've helped to promote when they when nobody knew any anything about them. But I also had to think back and say, okay, you know, what what's your proposition? What do you want to do? You know, give me an idea. Um, I was also wary, Phil, maybe not as paranoid as you were, but you know, just in the past there was this the Cyclops drama, et cetera. So, you know, I was wary of that. And, you know, if you're if you're a new brand starting out and you want to get exposure quickly, um, you know, I think it makes sense if you were going to do a Marvel Marvel release that, you know, you I'm one of the few people you'd reach out to try to get exposure right away. And so I've I'm actually really proud that I've helped a lot of the brands that get ramped up that we we know and love today. You know, LB, Lifebrick, you know, Jin, Jaka, um, uh, who am I missing? Abnormal, um, TMB, a lot of these brands maybe were well known in their home market back in Asia, back out here, but didn't necessarily have a Western audience, you know, and I'm proud that I'm, I'm, you know, helping to, to get, um, you know, the information and releases out to these really, really great top tier brands today. Is it, is it something you found that they tend to approach you first or did you ever like perhaps reach out to someone saying, look, I'm, I'm interested in your work. If you need help, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to share the love or. I think there's also a combination of the uh, the resellers as well because I know all of the major resource, resellers as well and they also remember when you're coming out with a brand you also need to make the connections in terms of how you're going to distribute it as well. Um so I've been behind the scenes a little bit in terms of making those connections or or seeing what's coming out as well and there's there's a lot of yeah, I would say behind the scenes discussions that happen um so there is definitely a little bit of a give and take there. I also reach out to there's a there's a, a WeChat community that's very active, 
in um, in Asia that you know I'm I'm in a flow in the flow of stuff and you'll see brands kind of coming out and I think you know people you know again uh, I think feel comfortable just given my sponsor sponsorship and knowing that I'll give a fair shake um, and like I said I think a lot of these go back I go back to to Ko and Kyle like right was his first customer and I loved his stuff from the very beginning um, and he was deep into X-Men stuff as well, which obviously was very much up my alley. Um, so I think just going back and having a history uh, and I think brands being able to trust that I'll I'll be able to give them a platform on a consistent well, basis. Well, going back to trust, um, I'm sorry, I want to caveat that real quick. Just like with our group chat, one of our, you said the main tenet was the group chat was, you know, basically don't be an asshole. But I think the rule, number one rule above that is what happens in the group chat stays in the group chat. Because we are, we do have a several folks such as yourself and myself and others that have these kind of routes into some of the underbelly of the custom world and what might be going on or what might be coming forward. That trust that you have with these brands can't be violated as well. For every one thing that we share with each other, there's probably like five or six things that we haven't shared just because we don't want to violate the trust of those brands that have been that have provided a roadmap of what they're working on or a design they want feedback on. One of the reasons, and please, Ed, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here. I would imagine one of the reasons also why your relationships have been built was simply just because of that trust. 100%. I mean, you guys know we, we get, um, we're privileged to be, have that trust and, you know, brands also reaching out to us collectively and, and individually about design elements you know, the next lineup. Um, and that trust is, is basically, Hey, they're, they're reaching out to us as sounding boards and saying, Hey, what does, does this make sense? Or, you know, what do you think? And also understanding and trusting that we have a, a pretty decent eye in terms of what we think is going to be both aesthetically, um, going to be work and also, you know, commercially is going to work as well. Like not everything is going to hit as well, but yeah, it comes down to an information that you, that I think all of us have have basically helped keep that trust in place, um, and I think after a while, it also kind of begs the question: if you're not, if you are a sounding board or a platform for all these major brands, um, and maybe you're not one of them, um, it does beg the question: hey, they don't have that kind of endorsement or th that trust. It's also another thing that I kind of feel a huge responsibility for as well in not letting people down, but also as a filter as well, in terms of what, what may not be, you know, kind of suitable or it's going to last, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you can't sort of, frankly, you can't be kissing their ass all the time. That's not what it's about. I mean, there are times I've told, uh, I've been privy to, you know, some ideas. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to sell or, and you, and sometimes you can't say why you can't be like, well, if I know brand X is making this, and brand Y tells me they're going to make it too. That's not my responsibility to tell Y not to make it or give brand X a warning. I can't do that. You got to stay neutral in all this. And that's probably the struggle that I've actually talked to Ed about. Um, you guys think I know stuff. Ed knows 10 times what I know. And, and so that I think is the biggest struggle is you want to remain neutral. You want to help everybody, but you also don't want to let anyone down. And you don't want anyone to be set up for success. I mean, for failure. Is there always, is there also a lesser responsibility there though too? Sometimes maybe someone shows you something and it's just shit, but you're too nice to say. Or, you know? <laughs> There's ways of phrasing that. You're not like, you don't say like, well, this sucks. Or, well, the problem, the problem I see here is you say, well, I have a concern. The way you've integrated this, I feel people might interpret it as that. Or do you have any, you know, knowing how people like to pose and, you know, take pictures of these things, have you considered the movement variable of, you know, can, can these legs move? Can this arm move? This particular character's had a lot of molded capes, but there's been some clamor in the past for cloth capes. Do you think that could be an option in the future? You know that kind of shit. You know, Brett, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you another shout out. I mean, I confided in Brett on my collab with PCB on my original Berserker. Oh, I showed him early designs of it. Yeah, I you know, and your 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 feedback was so impactful. Honestly, it made a lot of sense that uh, through the, the lens that I wasn't able to see because I'd seen so many, you know, versions of it. And then you just came out right away about kind of rounding that cowl and making it more 
Um, I actually yeah, have told it, you, I thought the camera was terrible. Like I was like, this is not working. <laughs> yes. and then, and then I, but then, you know, what is funny is, you're but right. the, no, but what was funny is, you know, I started pulling out like pictures of Mezgo figures and, and Marvel Legends figures and Hot Toys statues, references and comic panels. And I start, and then I start realizing, well, it may not be what I think it could be, it should be, but honestly, I don't see how it could be anything else because of the limitations of the of the manufacturer. And let me tell you guys right now, for those who don't aren't familiar with Wolverine's original suit, his debut in you know Incredible Hulk, that thing is a pain in the ass to make in a 3D format. And of all the examples yeah. I've seen through action figures, sculptures, high premium statuettes, they've all tackled it differently. And I got to give props to Phoenix Customs, Adam and Ed for the amount of work this guy's. He's been working on this for well, well over a year. I mean, and yeah. it was before COVID even, right? Remember, yeah. this is the next Couple topic now, so don't go too deep. Oh, into yes. it now. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. But I'm just, I'm just saying is I was very, I felt. Come on, Brett, this is your podcast. You said no better. I felt very blessed. I can meet you right now. No. Um, I uh, I felt very blessed and honored to be incorp- pulled into that. And, you know, it was hard. It was hard not to bottle in my excitement for that and not just tell other people that who I know would love that fig or who I also consider dear friends, not being able to tell them that kind of stuff. That's a big struggle is when you have a head full of secrets and you can't tell anybody. I mean, don't you know, prop, props to you in regards to that, because uh, as I said to you guys before, I'm not a fan of the original Wolverine design. Not not your figure, but the actual design itself. Because if you remember, when you actually showed it to us for the first time, I said, I hate it, it's perfect. And that's because it looks exactly like it's supposed to. And I ordered it straight away. And I didn't do that because you're my buddy. I did it because it's a bloody well done fig. Because like I said earlier, I, at the other day, my, my first uh, priority is to my collection, you know? So if I don't like something, I won't get it. But I liked it. Even though I don't like the, des- the design of the character, I like the actual fig, you know? And that's one of the reasons I love minifigs in general, because it is just a cutified version of, uh, you know, of, of a cool character. But um, interestingly, what you said, Ed, about um, the WeChat group, that, that struck me as interesting because when it comes to the brands from the East, we are in the West a very, very much a secondary market. So it is nice that you are that sort of link as well to a certain degree. So you do serve a purpose there as an actual link in that regard. Yeah, yeah I, I find it re- really interesting in that I think because I've been able to you know, for better or for worse, obviously I had a platform and a lot of these brands that were emerging from Asia understood that, yeah, they, if they wanted to become global brands and move beyond their home markets, they needed a platform. And for, you know, again, for better or for worse, I was able to be one of the key channels to to get the word out and to, to market and announce brands. Um, but at the same time, that has allowed me to be invited to some of their own personal because they all i think all of them have channels as well and um you know i they've been gracious and i've been so humbled and blessed to be able to be invited as as you know one of their own um and i'm very respectful for i always ping you know um because you'll see in my feeds and my stories like i share kind of things that are work in progress or the next thing and i get stuff all the time but i always run it by the individual brands whether or not they're they're cool to share with it um and some will say yes here's a better pick or here's or like no that's not ready to go um there's a couple things that i've been holding back on that look amazing that i'm you know i can't wait to share but like it's still kind of in the work in progress or the drawing board phase but yeah i mean i kind of feel like the wechat for those with that that don't know for the western audience like wechat is if you can imagine an app that's like Instagram, PayPal, um, Google, Search, um, Messenger, like everything in one. Facebook, it's everything. Everything is done on that app. You just need that one app. You can, you know, you chat with people, you find stuff, you pay with stuff, your banking is on it. You just everything. Everything is on WeChat. Um, th- that's their portal of the internet. They can just all day long just be on from the beginning to the end of the day, just be on WeChat. And so, yeah, that's a huge platform for, for Asia. That's awesome. also very difficult um, if you don't speak, speak the language. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually got invited to a Brahms chat once and it was just too overwhelming, the concept. Uh, you know, it's language barrier. There's no well. translation oh. feature, so... <laughs> Oh yeah, so I'd have been screwed then. I was I'd just been looking it's at screenshot Google, you know? Google Lens, <laughs> screenshot Google Lens, and it's just like it's exhausting. And I, uh, 
Yeah, it just wasn't working. Ain't nobody got time yeah. for that. <laughs> but um, obviously, I find all this interesting because, I mean, I've got 1,100 followers. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about when it comes to exposure. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, anti- I'm, anti-social. I'm anti-social as hell. I don't reach out to people. So the only reason I'm anywhere is because I get dragged, usually kicking and screaming by people like Brett onto the podcast or Ed into the group chat, you know. So um, obviously, when it, comes to, when it comes to growing the brand or your page, Obviously, um, I, I understand that Instagram sort of had a bit of a change to its algorithm and, and a big push towards things like Reels uh, for popularity. Did you find uh, growing your page challenging at this point? Did, did you did you notice a, a big change or, a, or, a, or a, a reduction in growth from that? I've definitely seen a plateau of followers. But like I said, I never did it. My page was never about gaining followers. Um, mine was always about you know, almost self-serving. Like I, if a brand does well um, and has a lot of followers and has success, they're going to do great stuff. That's great for me and my own collection as well. Um, it's all about sharing and building kind of the Lego Marvel community for me. Um, but yeah, I would say the that the evolution or migration to like short videos and clips of like that, the TikTok era that we are in, like I just don't have time for it, number one. Um, and reels, I think, has been something that as kind of a response to TikTok, which I feel like as a side, you know, we, we can probably get hijacked on this conversation. Like Instagram should just stick, you know, stick to their lane. Like the, that's they do what they do. They do it well. Like, why do you feel the need to become another TikTok? That's not going to work. If you want to do TikTok, you go to TikTok. Well, don't worry, because then you have then you have YouTubes now. TikTok's actually going to be extending the shorts. shorts. And now YouTube is going to be reducing the shorts. So it's, there's a happy middle in there somewhere. As a, as a side note, as a social commentary, you know, with two kids, I will say that I do bemoan the fact that, you know, back back in the day, we could sit down and read a book or like go through a video, like an hour video. If you looked at a younger person today and say, hey, check out this video, if it's over like 10 seconds, they look, look at you like, you know. You're, you're you're an alien like it, it, that's not so great i think oh i i watch i'd say about 95 percent of the youtube videos i watch i watch at 2x speed really get in process it and i'm like yeah I'll move on to the next one and it's it really is convenient when you're just trying to get you, you don't realize how slow people talk <laughs> until you once you turn that's off the, the 2x I read the oh article. my god it's like okay <laughs> Oddly enough, I can relate this to to DC and the Flash when he's just like everyone's so slow. <laughs> well, hopefully, we're not that slow, guys. <laughs> this podcast, hopefully, dude. Will I fly. edit this sometimes at two x. I, I edit the podcast and to find where the unnatural pauses are and whatnot. <laughs> and then when I put it back to to one x, I'm like, oh my god, this is just dragging on. <laughs> Brett, the Welsh speak fast at the best of times. So, how the hell do you understand what I'm saying? You, you do speak fast, faster than me, which is something to say. <laughs> it's a good thing I put captioning on the YouTube version of this. <laughs> this, this is me trying to slow down as well. But, uh, but uh, no, I mean, obviously, the reason I'm asking a lot of this is because we've got a lot of really fantastic photographers within our community and like like you said with brick hero graphics earlier they have no near the followers they deserve so i'm just wondering if there are any tips or tricks or any uh any secret recipes that might help them you know so you know no i always viewed myself as a real armchair photography i was never the best photographer i didn't have like a lot of great equipment i mean brett photography is like amazing and oh, i man. probably my photography is yeah, okay my photoshopping is amazing my photography is just okay uh, i just yeah. make it look amazing <laughs> yeah well hey listen you're jedi level photoshop you know they're gonna make anything yeah. look great look at make a potato yeah, camera look great. mark um, is the man i look to nowadays for photography his lighting is just insane yeah amazing insane uh yeah there's, that's jedi level photography and editing just special stuff so i've never ever been on that kind of level um i love actually kind of recreating stuff i think if you if you guys might remember the one from um winter soldier where steve rogers goes up against that quinjet um and then when i got the lb winter soldier i said i gotta kind of recreate that scene because i was just re-watching that um yeah i mean i think ultimately i wish i just had more time i'm sure when i get um some more downtime i'll definitely do more 
photography. In fact, a lot of some people have ping ping me and say, "Hey, listen, we'd be great to see some of your older stuff." And I look back and Flickr and just the earlier days where I had a lot more time and be thoughtful about like putting up a great post. I definitely want to come back to that and do that. Before we get into our next section, though, I do want to give you some credit because your editing skills are are good enough that there are a lot of people that come to me saying, "Hey." Where did he get this one thing? I'm like, no, no, dude, that fake doesn't exist. He photoshopped part of it. <laughs> so so the, some of the tweaks you've made to your mocks to make them fit the aesthetic of what you're aiming for have fooled quite a few people. Yeah. You have to do you what gotta you got to do. do. What you got to do, right? <laughs> you know, I really enjoy Life Bricks, uh, Winter Soldier, Black Widow. You know, the hair is a point of contention for a lot of people, but I think they nailed the face. Hmm. It's a little too orangey. Right. But it's a little too orangey. So yeah, if I were to shoot it, I would tweak the hair color. You know, same with, uh, we haven't had a really good, you know, Iron Man 2, Black Widow. Uh, Earthly Bricks did one, but the hair is not something that I really prescribe to. It's the best it's we're the going to get for now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Until Jin does oh, it. Geez. <laughs> On top of everything else he's doing. <laughs> okay, so we've got to talk about the collabs now. So, um... So obviously you, you recently did a pre-order collab with PCB for the Wolverine fig. But before we get to that, let's go back to the beginning. A lot of people won't know that back in the Flickr days, you did collaborate with another content creator known as Ramon. Uh, Bricks at Raminator was his, uh, was his handle. And you did do uh, a couple of figs. Um, if my memory serves correctly, uh, you did three digital figs. So you did Jubilee first, and then you did uh, one of your last ones was also a Jubilee, which was digital. You did Dazzler. Uh, from the X-Men. And you also did a pad printed Spider-Woman, which Brett will Yo! know very, very well because he spent many years looking for that one. <laughs> and I got it. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah, it took you did four it. years <laughs> and I finally got it. So that was um, eight years ago, that first fig, actually. I looked um, uh, earlier and the, the first Jubilee was eight years ago. So how did this come into being? What drove you to, to sort of decide you wanted to, to put figs out at the time? Yeah, it's, this is a, this is a great um, another evolution, I think, of some figs that you could only do so much with mocks. Uh, you could only wait for. You could ask. Remember, I remember when there was a just a few vent or brands out there. You could put in requests for stuff, but like I think you know, I had. And and to Ramon's credit, again, who was a, a fantastic designer, and he'd always be sharing great designs. Um, and we had gotten to talking about, hey, wouldn't be like, what's a character that like nobody would actually ever do? So that, that our first one was the Jubilee Techno Girl is what we ended up calling it because remember we were probably still in that uh, C and D era, so we were very you know wary about what to call it. Um, and you know, and and then it led to, you know, Dazzler. Um, we called her Dancing Queen, and then the Arachno was our first pad print, and that was we tackled that because there weren't any colors in it, right? So we were like, what could we do to save costs? Um, just a black and white fig, and if you have the original ones, you, you know, this was before they had the dual the the um, the dual mold uh, legs. So we had to actually print around that as well. But yeah, I think it was really just driven out of, hey, these are never going to get made. And these are great characters. Um, let's just go ahead and, and do these. And then uh, ultimately ended up doing the the Jubilee 2, um, which was effectively just the torso. And then that the, the sunglass kind of custom piece that was a kind of our first real kind of custom piece, uh, which has now led to uh, obviously the Wolverine as well so yeah i'm just um, and i also just give a shout out to you know dcb because i did the the collab with them on on gene gray um and also the ling i did that collab on with uh with Sabretooth as well so yeah i then and a lot of these are x-men characters right that are probably not going to get made as well until jen does it <laughs> <laughs> I just purely just not wanting to wait for other people to do. I'm getting sick of waiting. Sick of waiting and 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 stuff that probably isn't on the top of the list because you remember. I mean, if you did a pie chart, I'm just you know again, this is the finger in the air. But if you looked at the pie chart of what was what's been done in customs, at least in Marvel, like 
what percentage is going to be Iron Man, what percentage are going to be Spider Man, you know, what percentage will be Ca- Captain America, probably like a good, I don't know, the 80 20 rule and Thor. That just leaves very little room for, you know, just super great characters. That's that's probably one of the reasons why I think LYL was so interesting because they did high quality of these characters. Like, do you guys remember like the, he did the um, the Phoenix Force character? Oh yeah. Like, who would have ever thought of doing those? Like, the and you as a Spidey fan, Brett would know. Like, you probably, you probably, you probably have that one, right? I mean, oh yeah, he did Spidey Phoenix. Super yep. interesting. Yeah. Which is a. Yeah. So I would say, again, I think it, it was just a lot of um, and, and I want to give a shout out to Ramon because he was such a he is, is still probably, you know, I don't know how active he is. It's not active that much anymore, but was a, a great designer. It always comes down to design, I think, as well. I, I mean, I wanted to ask why why it sort of uh, it stopped happening. I, 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 if I remember correctly, you did tell me he had a child, didn't he? And he started sort of backing out of the community a little bit around that time. So was that the reason for it? Or was it just a case of you felt like you've done everything you needed to do? Or So I think it's a couple of things. Like I haven't spoken to him in a while. And it, it was, certainly wasn't because we had a falling out at all. Um, I think he was starting a family, which was like, you know, I think he was having his first kid. Um, and then there was also now a migration into IG, and I think he was probably – I don't know if he, have, he even ever created an IG I handle. I don't think so. I, I don't think he's ever come on to it. He's never, I've never seen him in the community at any point, you know, but uh, – because he, he was he was one of the close – but he was one of our close friends in the groups as well, you know, back in the Flicker days. He was one of the sort of main people that we uh, we all dealt with as well, you know, so – totally. Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be great for him to come back, and, and he's always welcome back. I'd love to do another collab with him. I, I'd love to welcome him back into the community. But I think it was a combination of he was probably just in, in a different place of his life, and then there was this this uh, this migration to IG, which I think he probably just said, "Hey, this is probably a good time to step back," and probably just that was I'd it. love to get a handle on some of his Spidey figs that he made for himself because I know he's got a few others that were never oh, released. Oh, yeah, he did a negative Spidey. I, I've got oh, I have one of those. Stunning. Yes. <laughs> oh, stunning. oh, another one that Phil's got. Great. Yeah, great. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, got got one. I got that one too. The negative space. Um, uh, we, uh, Ed, uh, Ed, find it later. We can send pictures to Brett to show him how nice it is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've got that screenshots that, that I stole off Flickr back in the day. You know, of like, you know, one day, I just keep an eye out for these things. I don't even put them in my, want, put in my public want list. Yeah, they, that that's very rare. Um, but yeah, yeah, great designs. When he, when he made figs for himself, it was literally like four or five figs, wasn't it? It was tiny amounts, I think. Well, getting the Arachno Girl, the Julia Carpenter Spider Woman, um, that was a um, grail fig for me for a long time. It's been my litmus test. Every time people talk to me about how, oh, I'm never going to find this fig, I'm like, dude, they always come around. Because it was four years, four years of collecting before I saw one. And then in, in like a six month time, I saw three go up for sale. Wow. Two of them I missed out on. One I found out after it was sold. And then the other one, I can't remember what happened, but it just didn't happen. I think they ghosted me. I don't remember. And then the third one I got, and it was actually the leg was damaged. The print on the leg was damaged a little bit, but I didn't care because, you know, now we have the dual molded, you know, white boot, you know, like the Punisher legs. And so I just swapped them out. And uh, so it's just as good as new. Oh, yeah, they fit, fit for purpose, isn't it? The the, the actual Lego legs. Well, no, it was the way that cool. if Lego had done dual molded back then, I mean, the print lines are identical. You know where where the white would start. And, yeah, and, yeah. So there was no. I didn't feel terrible for like swapping them out. Like, oh, it's not the official fig. No, no, it looks great. With regards to that, I mean, it was obviously it was a part of its time as well. So whilst you guys did a great job on the legs, and we're on there, you know, especially large areas of coverage with hard printing it does tend to be a bit tricky to perfectly get that lined up so i did find with it that you did see a little bit of white showing through with those as well so the lego legs are probably a much better option i mean obviously i know you would have picked that if you had remember it, the uh, era in which this was being legs. done as well the technology back then exactly yeah this was really early days exactly so yeah so it was like i said it's a product of its time you know but it was it's still a fantastic figure still got uh mine you know um well so that leads us on now to the um to the pcb uh, collab, which was uh, the uh, original appearance of Wolverine. Um, many will likely know that this was teased uh, many, many moons ago, uh, but then it seemed to hit a bit of a roadblock and it did become a bit of a running meme in the community, really, didn't it? Sort of ways uh, with the Wolverine, you know? So uh, what happened there? It was, was there anything specific, Ed, that, that sort of caused a delay or was it just uh, time constraints for Adam, for example? 
So, you know, I think we COVID really threw a monkey wrench into production across the board. So let's dial back the clock. Like, you know, I think um, when factories shut down and they did shut down, like at the height of it, remember, um, you know, there was a zero COVID policy. Right, they were shutting down like before us and well after we had re- – over here in the West, we reopened. They were still having periodic shutdowns. That's right. This was like everything was basically shut down and that really – you know, put behind schedule, like all the stuff that was in the pipeline, as you can imagine, like when you have orders in, and like, if you just think about everything that was in the system at that point in time, like a just in time, if you just imagine the old um, kind of like the factory line, remember like this, I'm dating myself, do you you guys ever watch Laverne and Shirley where she's like Lucille Ball's eating those chocolates because they're like all jammed up? (laughs) So uh, anyway, so that that was the first major factor where that just kind of threw a monkey wrench just broadly across the board. And then I think Adam and PCB just trying to manage his own schedule because we had thought about the design. And if things had gone normal course, he would have just been able to fit that through into the, into his normal kind of uh, schedule. So that was point number one. Um, and then also kind of trying to pivot to during that time, again, I, I don't know how much we want to go behind the scenes around distribution, production, design, and all that stuff, um, and making um, sure that he's kind of future-proofing his his own business as every brand was. So that took a back burner to that. And then we also wanted to get the design right, because even though we announced that, and if you guys remember, the very, very first teaser was 1974, which was the first appearance yeah, of folks Wolverine. were so confused. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure I did that on purpose, right? I just wanted to be a little bit, you know, people who really knew X-Men lore probably would have figured it out and who knew that like the top two characters that I always had said publicly, like Spidey and Wolverine for me are like 1A, 1B of all time for me. Um, but at any rate, yeah, so that's that, that was just a case of bad bad timing in terms of COVID and then just making sure that we got the 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 design right. Okay. And I, I, I'm really curious about this. Uh, what was your involvement in the project? I mean, obviously I know you commissioned it and you get design approval. And I'm pretty sure I I, meant, I heard you mention the other day that you'd actually um, sent the parts off to the printer. So I'm assuming you sourced the parts as well, did you? I did source the parts. Um, again, we're getting into a lot of the design and production nitty gritty. There's some, sometimes where the, the producer or the, the printer will have all the parts on hand or have some kind of inventory um, where they're able to source it. And other times they, they weren't. And I think that that also was a backup in terms of what was available or not. So I think just to smooth line, smooth out the process, you know, I decided to get all the parts directly and then ship them off to the printer. So that's, that's what happened. But, but again, I guess just to give a little bit of insight here and, you know, I'm sure, Brett, you'll have Adam back on the podcast at some point as well. But my perspective when I was speaking to to Adam PCB around, hey, because we had always talked about, hey, we should do a collab. Um, and he knew that I would I had a soft spot for uh comic related variants. And he did, he didn't really do a lot of comic related because he he's done mostly MCU stuff, but he has done in the past, you know, comic related stuff. And so he wanted to sick his teeth into doing something too. But we both agreed that Let's do something that nobody's done, and let's do some. Let's do something that's kind of like going to be a little bit of a challenge as well. And that, to me, well, I remember what I guess I remember what I not, like you know, told some of you guys. You were just like, "Ooh, that's not going to be so great." Like, how are you going to do that? Like, uh, and then I remember when it first dropped. Like, people who didn't really understand what what that was were just like, "This looks funny." Like, what is that? And I was like, "Actually, if you if you know." The first re- first appearance is, I think, a pretty pretty damn good design that was faithful to the design. But yeah, so that we did something that we wanted to to be challenging. I made a, a point to when I when I posted it to my stories to actually include a pictures of the suit in various other media so people understood what the reference was. And I I hope that helped a little bit. Totally, yeah, I think it. did. There were definitely yeah. people that recognized and were like, "Oh, that's amazing, and we need that now." Uh, and then there were folks who are like kind of turning a side eye, like I don't get it. I'm just wondering now if um, if uh, Hugh Jackman's appearance in Deadpool three ends up being the classic classic Wolverine, 
people are going to go batch it looking for that figure. They oh, have to that'd it be amazing. <laughs> yeah, totally. That would be that'd be a great like like a little two second Easter egg when he tries on a cow. He's like, nah, this ain't working. <laughs> that'd exactly. be awesome. Exactly. So, do you have any uh, plans for future collabs? Uh, any characters in mind, for example, or any other brands that you're eyeing? Yes, I do have future plans. Um, but like, hopefully, what I want to be able to do is um, make sure we execute on what we have. Um, you know, and again, I price this at a point where I'll I will actually say. say I'm not shy to state this publicly. I'm not, I don't make any money off of this. Like for me, I've, it's not what the reason I did it. Um, I wanted this to be made. I wanted to do a collab with, with Adam and PCB. I'm really proud of the design and what we put together. I hope like, you know, again, everybody enjoys that. Um, but yeah, I've definitely have plans to do follow-ups um, and future, you know, releases. So watch the space. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about, doing that going forward but making sure we do it in, a, in the right way you should do a collab with awesome. kyle do a version two of jubilee's pad that would uh, be awesome that's a, there's an idea that is you guys idea. are good buds it was one of your first figs it's a very sought after fig 90s x-men appearance i think would be perfect actually if you did the 90s x-men cartoon you know there jubilee. was um there was one on ebay on ebay there's one on facebook recently and everyone was like shocked to see it. I don't think people, like the crowd that was there seeing it, I don't think they recognize the significance of it. I think that'd be kind of neat. I think yeah. that'd be, I mean, cause that's right up his alley of what he's working on. And then you guys can just kind of do your thing together. I think that'd be cool. So here, here first, here, here first. <laughs> I, I demand, I demand my logo in a footnote. <laughs> Absolutely. Ooh, that's what we can do. We can do a, we can do a Brett and Ed collaboration, but. You know, we, we need a designer. Yeah, I'd love to do a collab with you. I mean, listen, um, nothing's off the table. Um, it definitely, obviously, you have to be. Um, if we, if you could find a comic Spidey that hasn't been covered. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> I, I would definitely, you know, I definitely want to do something if I did something that nobody really has done. Right. Like and that's unique. I want to throw it out there then. Doppelganger. Oh, I want the doppelganger God. Doppelganger thing. would no be amazing. One one. No one big one. At one point, I did thought I did think I'd convinced one of the brands to do one. They said, oh, that sounds interesting. And then I never When did Jin made again. the six-arm Spidey with the magnetic attached arms, I thought, this is it. We're finally going to get a doppelganger. But no, nothing happened. That needs to be a call-up, guys. Do a doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right well challenge i guess i am typecasted i guess if i were involved in anything it has to be a spidey fig. so uh oh, of course come on i will do my due diligence and research an idea um that would that would appeal that has to be wide appeal right because with, like i was telling uh somebody we need a pad printed null figure but a lot of people don't know who the fuck null is uh for those who don't know who null is mm. k-n-u-l-l he's the god he's the He's the king in black. He was the um, the symbiote god. God of the symbiote. Yeah, he created the symbiote race. Right. Spoiler, in the comics, he's no longer the king in black. Venom is, but, and Carnage is on his way to defeat him. But that's a whole other podcast. (laughs) Actually, I think Abnormals with their style. I would think they would do a great job with Null, personally. Obviously, at the moment, there's a large point of contention in pre-orders and the pre-order model in general. Uh, it's used by the majority of brands. Obviously, some have gone against the grain now. Uh, but for the most part, most brands are still using the pre-order model. And it is an issue for many people. So what is your take on this, Ed? Yeah, this is a situation that's a little bit tricky. Um, I think that for tr- tried and true uh, trusted brands out there, you're still going to be able to to command you know, people to open up their wallets for effectively, you know, you, the community, we always joke, like, what other industry do you, <laughs> you pony up cash for product that's going to kind of come down the line and you're not going to even physically see that. I've product. got an answer for that. Like, you know, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the it? premium, <laughs> you know, the premium car industry, you know, I'm talking about the, the big wheel, you know, the, the $500,000 cars and the million dollar cars. You know, premium statue industry like Sideshow and Hot Toys, Mez, the premium right. action figure toys like Mezco, 
even the limited edition uh, vinyl presses and uh, memorabilia, you know, poster series from like places like Mondo. I mean, there's plenty of industries out there that command a pre-order culture. What is unique is that none of those industries that I've just named have a equivalent that can be um, construed as having a, a cheaper alternative. The problem with the premium Lego right. thing is it's still Lego. So people hear Lego, they think cheap, fast, mass produce, and not worth any money beyond like maybe five to fifteen dollars off Bricklink. So I think if and I, I know you were about to prove a point here, I'm sorry to interrupting, but I think if people could get the Lego part out of the of the name and just call, call them premium customs or yeah, it's just a, it's just a medium. For it's art, a boutique it? yeah. hobby meant for people that have the financial means to sustain it. It's not meant. To, it's not an accessible hobby for just anybody. For those who think they can just jump in and just buy everything, and I've seen it. I've seen it recently. The secondhand market right now is flooded. You, it is so hard to sell figs right now, and I see this as somebody who runs the geek the geek exchange, and I'm trying to sell my own figs. A lot of people are selling figs at a loss or at cost because they just can't move them because there's so much coming out now that they thought they can keep up with it all. And they realize, well, I need to just focus on what I really like. Sorry, sorry for that tirade. <laughs> no, not at all. But I think the last point where we, we've got to make sure that, you know, we keep people on track is, you know, again, when you get other parties involved that are in the flow of, you know, of taking orders. And then, you know, there's a lot of, that's a lot of capital that's tied up, you know, and if things go sideways or there's some delays, you know, that can get to be a really tricky situation. Um, and so we're just hoping that, you know, everything kind of works out. I think there's a, le a level of putting your trust into making sure that everybody kind of delivers. Um, because it's it's a little bit of a slippery slope when there's a there's a kink. We saw a little bit of that during COVID and and a lot of delays happening. That can be very very frustrating. So yeah, fingers crossed. Little pro tip for anybody trying to start a brand or commission a fig, and you do pre orders. When you get that money, that money is somebody else's money. It is not your money yet. It's not your money until your product is delivered. And so all that money, you don't touch it. It's not emergency fund money. It's not fun money. It is production money. And you'd be surprised how easily that gets lost because people are sitting on a pile of cash and they forget that money belongs to somebody else that's got to print these parts and source the parts. And as someone who is source, who's getting their own sig fig printed right now, I can tell you right now, it is not cheap. And I am doing it without pre-orders. And it is not cheap, especially getting the parts, especially because all you fools want special colors. It is not cheap. Don't get me started on spring green and coral, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think people are really, I think the one thing that we can probably share just as we get into this nitty gritty is people don't really appreciate, yeah, what the cost is to do a nice pad print with custom designed elements. Uh, that's, yeah, it, it's not cheap. Yeah, and, and there's a level of complexity. I mean, you've got like, and this is by no means I'm not disparaging either brand when I mention this. You know me, I'm a, I'm a very neutral person on this podcast for a reason. So you've got like Muddy River, who does the classic Lego Marvel superheroes video game stuff. It's, I don't want to insult it by saying simple, but is it definitely, there's still complexities to it. There's alignment issues. There's extra challenges because it's a, a more minimalist design. It's got to be super clean, right? You can't, you can't fudge the details at all. But then you've got like, Legend C mock, they always put in their descriptions of like, it's like been pad printed like 250 times because they've got all these textures and patterns and stuff. There's complexities on both ends of the spectrum. I get a little irritated when people say, oh, but it's all simple fig. There's no molds. It should be, it should be easy. It should be cheap. Or There's still, the less that you have to look at, the harder it is to make look good because there's no room for error. Whereas if you got a complex pattern, like you're doing chainmail patterns or some sort of cloth, you know, flowery thing, you could probably fudge it a little bit. No one's going to notice off, to, you know, off the top. But with that also comes the increased cost of doing all those patterns and colors. 
there there's a balance to be had and there is no cheap option i should say and it is unfair to to compare brands as well because as you've said uh, brands have different aesthetics uh, they have different setups for how production oh, absolutely. goes for their figs so it, you know i always find it very unfair when someone says well this fig came out much quicker by this brand why isn't this brand doing it as well it, well people people like, like you said people seem to uh, we we've seen this before people have commented things saying like you know this would never happen if it was amazon but amazon's got more money than god um these are all small uh, project management, you know what I mean? With um, and a lot of them are sent to comp- uh, not to companies, sorry, to factories. And you've got to think as well, these factories they're just taking on print jobs. But if uh, if you've got a guy making say 200 pad printed minifigures and then someone else comes in with an order for 10,000 mugs to be printed, you're going to want to make the 10,000 mug guy happy first, aren't you? So he's going first on the print run, most likely. Yeah, so that's one thing that um, I was going to interject earlier when I was talking about COVID and these factories. When they ramped up, they had to prioritize where the money, you know, what's going to pay to keep the lights on. And minifigures may not, these, these small print run minifigures aren't, aren't going to do it. It's going to be these jobs of 10,000, you know, units or a thousand units. So it wasn't just like fire up the machines and start printing minifigures. It's like minifigures need to get in line and they're not the top priority. Yeah. And like right. you said, they're not large companies, these brands. They're sometimes just one person managing a project, which is the other the other side of the planet it's not like they can suddenly use they've got a job so they can't just suddenly drop everything and fly out to this factory to try and put phoenix along, customs you know and phoenix it's not customs like- jaka uh my recent interview with many bigs which hasn't been released yet yeah there's all these brands that are just like they're just a few people with a dream and not a full-on conglomerate with a headquarters and their own distribution you know uh suppliers and manufacturers it, it's yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of preconceived notions about what a minifig brand is, and honestly, I think if a lot of folks got behind the curtain as much as they want to be, they'd be disappointed about how non glamorous it really is. <laughs> yeah, actually, for sure. um, Ed, I forgot to ask this earlier because we didn't ask you. Yeah, um, like I said, you've been you've been in the game uh, literally apart from a couple of months as long as I have. Basically, um, you you often refer to us as lifers. It's a term I've adopted and I love, and I've always used it since you first said it. But have you ever actually felt burnout yourself, or have you ever had doubts about your continuing collection, or is it something that's literally just never crossed your mind? No, I think people, when you, whenever you're doing something for for a long time, you definitely have ebbs and flows. I, I certainly think that over the last couple of years, just because I've been so busy i've had a big move you know i moved from from hong kong back to singapore and i've been in singapore for a while but i've been in asia you know for for a long time um but you know i've had some some things you know just some changes happening in terms of like a shift in 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 um in a career as well and just a lot of travel so i think it's not that i've had any less enthusiasm for the community and for collecting um, I certainly, I think I will always have um, that as a, my kind of main hobby and interest. It's just managing time. Um, and I certainly don't think that I've had enough time to allocate over the last kind of couple of years, but hopefully I'll be able to manage that better. I certainly don't have any less enthusiasm for it. In fact, I'm really excited about all the great stuff that we are seeing. I think it gets a little bit overwhelming sometimes. That's the That's one thing where there's just so many releases happening i actually feel bad for like i look at i think about brett and you know your commitment to spidey and like you had no way home and that was such a painful period i'm sure and then now you have oh, a, across the spider verse like it just not well, you stop, know right? you know what sucks about it going back to you know you build these relationships with brands or resellers and they'll come to you like hey you like this fig i'm like i love it i'm not buying it because i can't afford it because i'm buying all these spideys so, like, I was talking to Abnormal the other day, and I was just like, you know, these Batman look great. And honestly, I'd get the entire set over the course of time, but I just can't focus on Batman. I do have, like, I have, like, two Battison figs. I like to grab the Life Break one. Right now, I just have Cross Check and, and uh, Abnormals. <laughs> it's just like, I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I just can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll share it, though. Does that help? Is that good? Is that okay? Hey, Phil, let me ask you a question. I mean, you collect a lot of different things like how do you i can't even imagine i just do marvel and i couldn't imagine if i had to do something outside of marvel like star wars or like dc or just 
hire, yeah, just everything that's out there. Like, how how do you manage it? Like, what? How do you prioritize? Dude, I don't even fucking know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I I was saying to you guys earlier. At the moment, superheroes are kind of on the back burner. It's not intentional. I still eat, sleep, and breathe superheroes. I literally watched all three episodes of Gen V just last night on Amazon. You know, I, if it's on, I watch it. So it's always my per, you know priority in like my own zeitgeist, if you get what I mean. But uh, but like I, I've looked at a bunch of 2099 figs being released recently and I love one of these figs, but for some reason I can't pull the trigger. So I think I'm just, I just have phases. It's a bit like manic depression, I suppose. I'm having manic episodes for certain characters, you know? So at the moment, the things that excite me, because I got excited by the K-Town potions today. Um, zombies are my big thing at the moment. So if I, if there's ever a chance to get hold of CB zombies, I, I'll... Uh, I'll you know, I'll happily go for that. Um, I, I keep making stupid mistakes and getting into new things that are making me want to buy Lego of it. Like, uh, I'd never watched The Office until a month ago, and I binged the entire office, and now I want that Lego office. Oh, that's great. I still haven't so, assembled, yeah, I still so assembled it, but I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I always used to say, I, I couldn't buy um, anime figs because I didn't like anime eyes on figs, but I've started an anime collection now. So I, I, I'm not a good example for anyone when it comes to, to self-control, you know? I think uh, how I limit myself is I don't earn enough money to buy everything I want. So, <laughs> you know, I've got to eat, basically. That's how I limit myself. <laughs> 100%. All right. Well, for folks who are still here, thank you so much for sticking through this. This might be part two of two. I don't know if I'm going to split it up yet. Well, we'll see how that goes. Ed, did you have any other questions for us or any parting thoughts you'd like to express? No, first, Brett, again, I um, want to thank you. Uh, you've been such a great flag bearer for the for the community and all the great things that you've been doing. You know, it's been great having you part of the community. Um, certainly, um, Phil, you and I, we, this is the first time we're actually talking. So we've known each other for like 10 years. Um um, it's great. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we chat all the time. I'm um, just sharing this and, and our, our love of the community and what we do in terms of, you know, collecting, it's been great sharing. Um, and yeah, looking forward to, 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 you know, connecting with you guys going forward and the community as well. All right. Well, that being said, then we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, once again, thanks for Phil and Ed traversing all these different time zones to make this happen today, <sighs> man. We got so much more coming in store. Ed, maybe if you um, catch up on opening up all your boxes, you can come back for our episode about the best figs of 2023. Oh, yeah. Looking That's forward to that. That's going to be a chaotic sure. episode. I'm gonna, I'm, I plan to have a lot of people on there. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. For those who are interested in anything we've talked about, I'll put as many links as I can in the show notes. And we'll be sure to check out a good fellow minifigs on Instagram. And of course, Phil Fat Cat Bricks as well. And if you're not following me, that's Geek Over 40. If you want to show any support for what I do, there's a link in the show notes to buy me a coffee. And I think, Ed, you also have got a buy me coffee link for all the things you do. So if you want to give Ed some love too, never obligated, always appreciated. And until then, we're going to sign off and see you next time. Say bye. Bye, bye guys. I want you on my rack. I want to make you ring. I want you to unwrap. Bring me the next shiny new